Thank you for your attention. Thank you. I hate to interrupt the good conversations. Uh, I'm Steve Usselman again. I was uh, here this morning for a while, the chair of the History and Sociology Department, and I'm going to chair this next session. Before I do, I'd like to call up my colleague, Professor Carla Girano, who has an announcement about an upcoming event. Hi, it's so great to be here, and uh, you've all seen the wonderful things our students are doing. So one event that we have coming up is on April 13th, on Thursday, April 13th, we're going to initiate our Phi Alpha Theta Honors Society members and also have our undergraduate <laughs> awards. And when we do that, we always invite someone to come speak to us, and our speaker this year is going to be Charissa Threat, who's at Spelman College. And she's going to be speaking on intergroup relations, nursing, and civil rights in the mid 20th century, in mid 20th, 20th century America. The poster is here. It is on the table out there if anyone's interested. It'll also be on our website. And it's another great occasion to hear about all the wonderful history that's taking place in Atlanta. So I hope that some of you will join us. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. So it's uh, my pleasure uh, to welcome you to a session that has a wonderful title <laughs> called uh, Commerce from Scratch. I'm someone who studies business and writes about railroads and IBM, biggest, the biggest businesses you can imagine. And within the next hour and 15 minutes, we get to hear about quite different sorts of businesses, business from scratch, and I like that. Our first uh, speaker we're very fortunate to have coming from Vassar College, where he's uh, an associate professor of <coughs> uh, both uh, and of history and a director of the Africana Studies program, uh, Dr. Quincy Mills. Uh, Quincy uh, spent a lot of time pondering one of the most important small businesses uh, in African American culture, the barber shop. Uh, but he's, and he has published a, a book on that subject, very well received, called Cutting Along the Color Line Black Barbers and Barber Shops in America. Uh, he's working now more broadly about uh, the place of business, wages, the African American economy, and, and participation in public spaces and, and public discussion and, and politics. And uh, he's going to share with us some of his work in that area today. So please welcome Quincy Mills. that myself quite see what I was doing. Uh, oh, uh, uh, All right, so uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, it's been, this, uh, the first session was really, uh, the first couple of sessions, um, really fantastic. Uh, good to be down here in Atlanta, especially when it's a little bit cold uh, in New York. I think that does it. Uh, can everyone hear me in the back? I will say yes. Um, Two of the wealthiest African Americans uh, in the history of Atlanta came to prominence in the antebellum and postbellum period, standing above white men with a straight razor, stroking their faces and their throats. <laughs> let me just let that sit for a second, uh, and just let you think about that image for a moment, uh, the kind of iconic image that uh, Melville sort of sketched in Benio Cerino, um, and um, um, other places. Um, again, I'm excited to be here among some really intriguing scholars of Atlanta, uh, the Civil War, and Reconstruction. Uh, we can certainly say that Reconstruction is probably one of the most exciting periods in American history. Uh, it's a period when questions of freedom and equality were on the national, national agenda, uh, when proposals for reparations were before Congress, uh, when more black politicians held office um, than ever before or since. Um, what we know uh, is that slavery was a system of labor. 
was a form of race relations <clears throat> and the foundation of a ruling class. And so conflict over the meanings of freedom resulted in the conflicts over these three components of Southern life. Uh, historian Eric Foner argues that economic autonomy and political participation were central to Black's definitions of freedom. Uh, economic autonomy was a market definition of freedom where freed men and women look to claim the fruits of their labor. Although this could be achieved through wages, land ownership was the source of independence in 19th century America. Uh, as we think about this question of what does resilient mean and what did a resilient Atlanta look like, um, those two barbers that I, that I, that I alluded to uh, earlier uh, don't tend to come to mind when we think about a resilient Atlanta. Uh, the two barbers I'm talking about uh, are Robert Webster and Alonzo Herndon. Uh, Webster was an enslaved barber in Atlanta before the war uh, and continued his work in its aftermath. Herndon came to Atlanta as a freeman after Reconstruction. Um, uh, we know much about um, Herndon. His palatial home still stands on University Place uh, in Northwest Atlanta. And as insurance company, Atlanta Life uh, still insures black consumers and, and, and more uh, to this day. Uh, Webster and Herndon don't tell us much about sharecropping and perpetual debt, um, which is what we, uh, again, sort of tend to focus on when thinking about the, uh, the post-Civil War period uh, and certainly the post-Reconstruction period. Uh, uh, Reconstruction tends to represent uh, opportunity within the sort of rubble of destruction, right? A chance to rebuild or to reimagine. Uh, since this symposium is about the Civil War and its aftermath, it seems paramount that we engage on some small level at least, the Emancipation Proclamation. Yet, while it might seem counterintuitive, I argue that it's a mistake in some ways to attach freedom to the Emancipation Proclamation. Yes, the Proclamation used the prospects of freedom to raise the stakes of the war. Lincoln doubled down, but he didn't go all in. The proclamation was not about justice, it was not about equity, it was not about equality, it wasn't about humanity. Therefore, the aftermath of the Civil War signaled a new day, but more than anything else, it signaled an embroiled battle over the meanings of freedom for African Americans. And I stress for African Americans because the prevailing question during and after Reconstruction was what to do with the freed people. Freedom is a contested process that in the US has historically been defined in both state and market terms. When I, and so uh, what I mean by uh, defined in state terms, where the state giveth, the state can of course taketh away. Uh, and that in a capitalist economy, money and capital have determined the limits and boundaries of freedom. So freedom, I would argue, right, freedom rests neither with the state nor with the market, but rather should be embedded in the human condition. The prevailing instrument that mediated freedom after the Civil War was the contract. Contract freedom not only constituted market relations, but it also constituted domestic relations. Indeed, much of the history of Reconstruction chronicles wage labor contracts, relief efforts, education, and the reunification of families. What do we make of the essence of the contract? How can we assess contract relations in the absence of a physical contract? And here's where I'm thinking about barbers here, right? Again, we're not wage laborers. They were not sort of signing these contracts with white employers. Uh, but I'm gonna argue here that they were uh, entering into uh, racial contracts that were defined by a racialized market. Let's think a bit about Atlanta and the war. The black population in antebellum Atlanta was rather small. In 1850, there were 512 black people in Atlanta, 19 free blacks, and uh, 493 enslaved folks. In 1860, uh, uh, the census accounted for an increase of almost 400%, mostly slaves, 25 free blacks, and uh, 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 just over 1,900 uh, enslaved people. In 1850 and, 18, uh, and 1860, the, the black population remained a constant 
the first census after the war, uh, the 1870 census, recorded the most dramatic increase during this period. Not only did the number of African Americans decrease from um, uh, uh, just over 1900, 1860, to just over uh, 9900 in 1870, but the percentage of African Americans in the city increased from 20% to 46% while the percentage of whites decreased from 80% to 54%. To be sure, uh, both demographics grew, uh, but the number of African Americans grew at a greater rate. Uh, the large number of uh, enslaved folks who fled plantations in the countryside account for a good portion of this, uh, of this influx, uh, like the businessmen who rushed to Atlanta to find the sort of gold nuggets and destruction. They too were looking to rebuild. They were less concerned with rebuilding Atlanta, but rather for looking to rebuild their lives and communities. But I'd like to focus on an instance of black opportunity, of market pushes and pulls. The experiences of Robert Webster provide us a small window into antebellum black entrepreneurial life in Atlanta. Webster arrived in Atlanta in 1856, bound to Benjamin Yancey. Before arriving in Atlanta, Webster had faced the fate of many enslaved African Americans treated as commodities. He was sold several times, and on one instance was the pawn and a gambling wager. Yancey allowed Webster to hire out his time as a barber. Uh, Yancey, rec though, required Webster to pay uh, him $150 uh, for the privilege of hiring out his time. Uh, Webster joined a small community of free black barbers in Atlanta during the late 1850s. In 1859, Erasmus Cobb operated a barbershop in the Washington Hall uh, Hotel uh, uh, near the railroad tracks, one of the city's first hotels along with the Atlanta Hotel. The Markham House would later sort of stand in place of the Washington. <coughs> William Doherty Hutchins was also in this small circle of black barbers. He purchased his freedom in 1852 and opened a shop with his two sons, Stiles and Alvin. Uh, Stiles and Alvin, like uh, most other children of barbers, uh, often work as bootblacks or porters uh, inside of barber shops. What we know is that Webster did quite well as a barber. Uh, but Webster did not rest in his barber's chair with the razor in his hand. He also tried his hand at the game of risk. Um, he offered loans to gamblers uh, and even sort of accepted jewelry and gold as payment where those who did not have cash to pay. Uh, it's striking that Webster was allowed to engage in loans as an unfree person. Um, uh, uh, one of Webster's contemporaries, uh, William Johnson, uh, who was a free black barber in Natchez, Mississippi, he also loaned money uh, to many of his white customers um, uh, that he was free and had white politicians as clients uh, in many ways sort of accounts for um, Johnson being able to do this work uh, and I would argue that uh, Webster, his, uh, Webster's clients gave him the space to do this work uh, because they uh, enjoyed his services um, but also particularly enjoyed the service of the black person serving them. Uh, Throughout Webster's work, let's be clear, he was still enslaved. Thomas Dyer, uh, the scholar who has done the most work on Webster, uh, described him as, quote, half slave, half free. Historians have employed a few terms to describe enslaved workers who hired out their time in the city, quasi-free or masterless slaves. Yet white masters, black employers, and the law determined the degrees of freedom slave barbers could enjoy. Matters of degree, however, are luxuries of distant historical analysis. Enslaved barbers in southern cities might have been quote unquote mastered with slaves, quasi free, or half slave, half free, but they were nonetheless enslaved. Ebenezer um, Allison, uh, who was a barber in Richmond, served his time in a, in Richmond, Virginia, served his time in a um, uh, barber shop. Uh, he was hired out from um, his master, John Foster, who according to Ebenezer was a quote-unquote kind master. Uh, his kindness, though, fell short of freedom, which Ebenezer had no middle ground. He said, quote, I had no right to leave him in the world, but I loved freedom better than slavery, end quote. 
If living among free men and earning wages was a privilege, having to relinquish a portion of their earnings and being so to a more controlling owner reminded barbers that they were not free. Um, uh, Isaac uh, uh, Throckmorton, uh, who was a barber in New Orleans, believed that he lived a free life because he worked and lived among free blacks. Um, and, and just to point of clarification, in the South, it was black barbers who controlled the barbering industry, right? Uh, and so when enslaved uh, uh, African Americans were hiring out their time as barbers, they were hiring out, hiring out their time in the barbershops owned by free blacks, right? So those free blacks would have been their sort of, you know, employer, for lack of a better term here. Um, so, so Isaac said, quote, only when, when, when he, his master, would send for me to come around, uh, uh, that would let me know that I was, I was not altogether free, end quote. So the moments when Isaac was called to, quote, unquote, come around were perhaps moments when his owner expected the agreed on portion of Isaac's income. Being summoned, and, being, being summoned and forfeiting a portion of the fruits of his labor represented critical aspects of Isaac's freedom, much like Robert Webster. Barbering offered him the opportunity to live in relative freedom, at least for intermittent periods of his life in the city. Quite simply, they wanted to be neither slaves on the plantation nor hired out slaves living relatively free. Even as apprentices to free black barbers, there was no solace to, the bond, to their bondage in a masterless labor arrangement. And again, Webster understood very well that he was not free uh, when he had to pay his master uh, what his master uh, thought was coming to him. Uh, but also, he realized he was not free when he shaved unionists in the Confederate jail in Atlanta. One Union prisoner uh, wanted more than a shave, though, and a haircut from Webster. So Webster was, would go into the prison and, and shave the, uh, the inmates and so forth. But one prisoner wanted more. He asked Webster to help him escape. Well, initially hesitant and fearing for his own safety, Webster, though, eventually supplied the prisoner with rope to scale the prison walls. Webster, as we see, saw more opportunities for himself in the prison besides shaving. As I talk about in my larger book, uh, uh, Cutting Along the Drill Line, uh, the economic space of barbershops were also spaces of captive clientels. And so the patron in the barber's chair being groomed was certainly captive to the razor. He needed to remain still and attentive. Barbers understood this position quite well, but also a crowd of men waiting for their turn in the chair. And I call these folks this, the, the, the larger waiting public, right? Folks sitting in the waiting chairs, either waiting to, to get into the barber's chair or just there to hang out and talk. Uh, people who are unlikely to move for a period of time are people who are an audience for something, right? And so you can think of social media in our, in our own time, right? When you're on Facebook, you're being watched, right? And when you're being watched, you're being advertised to in some capacity, right? You're a captive clientele. Uh, and, and that's certainly what was, what's happening in barbershops. That's why we tend to sort of uh, uh, become quite interested in, in barbershops, because the folks who are there waiting, in, you know, waiting to get a haircut, they're just hanging out, uh, they're talking, they're debating, they're arguing, they're engaging in moments in, in um, uh, issues of local politics, national politics, or, or international politics, or just there for, for leisure. Uh, it's that waiting public that I that, that, that argue sort of defines uh, what I call a, um, a black commercial public sphere as opposed to the traditional public sphere that that's also talked about. But back to Webster uh, and the prison. You see, Prison, like slavery, has a funny way of revealing the paradox of American slavery and freedom. At various watershed moments in American history, slavery has been the antithesis to freedom, meaning when America has constituted freedom, it has solidified bondage. Let me say it again. So when America has historically constituted freedom, it has solidified bondage. The American Revolution, right? Freedom, freedom, freedom. 
It's also the time where slavery gets really entrenched, right? Uh, the Declaration, major document. Again, thinking about freedom, solidifying bondage. Um, the 13th Amendment, right? What a shared moment in American history, right? What a shared moment, thinking about freedom, and the 13th Amendment says neither, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, and can't even, can't even get the whole sentence out, except as punishment for a crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to its jurisdiction, okay? Just as it's thinking about freedom, it's thinking about who would not be free, right? It's a really sort of powerful thing to think about. And that's to say that we can't just talk about slavery and freedom in this sort of linear conversation that once there was slavery, then there was freedom, right? Freedom's not static, slavery's not static, right? Both are very dynamic and there are ways in which they have historically come to define each other, right? Um, and so between the cracks of bondage, right, are glimmers of the light of freedom, right? The sparks of resistance or the market opportunities of a helpless class. And so Webster in this prison tapped into this ethic of a capitalist order. So while shaving in the prison, he speculated in money. Unionists um, who wanted U.S. greenbacks sort of gave Webster their Confederate money and he traded it for U.S. currency obtained from the prisoners. So Webster uh, used the Confederate currency to purchase such items as, as tobacco. And he purchased a lot of tobacco. And we know he purchased a lot of tobacco <laughs> because after the war, uh, he'd foul um, uh, uh, um, 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 a claim with the Southern Claims Commission for the tobacco that the Union, that, uh, the Union Army took from him, that he claimed took from him, right? Uh, and so much of that tobacco he, co he got from speculating money here in the prison. So where Webster saw opportunities in uh, the war prison, the masses of enslaved folks saw opportunities in war itself. During the Civil War, enslaved African Americans seized their freedom when they recognized the disruptions of war. A Louisiana plantation owner noted in September of 1862 that his slaves, quote, refused to work and others wanted wages. Now this is to say that enslaved folk didn't need the Emancipation Proclamation to think about freedom. They've been thinking about freedom for quite a long time, right? And they didn't need the war itself, right, to sort of find their spaces, right, to sort of seize freedom. Uh, so when plantation owners joined the Confederate um, uh, Army or fled north and west to avoid battle, enslaved African Americans left the plantation, took control of their lives and work, and in some cases took control of abandoned lands. And so let's talk briefly about abandoned lands. So after capturing Savannah, I wanted to, and I think it's important, some, some of this, most of this you already know, uh, but I think it's important to sort of lay out again how, we, how uh, freedom has been tied to the market, but also how uh, African Americans have looked to, to have sort of been situated within that, well, again, what I'm calling sort of a racialized market. Um, after capturing Savannah uh, in January uh, of 1865, uh, Sherman issued, as we said, uh, as I think Charles, uh, I think he's still here, uh, said, uh, special, order field order, spil special Field Order 15, setting aside land on the Sea Islands and along the coast of South Carolina and Georgia for black settlement. It's important here. I should note that this idea to redistribute land emerged not from Sherman's hand, but from a discussion between Sherman uh, Secretary of War um, um, Edward Stanton and 20 black ministers in Savannah, Georgia on January 12th. So following his famous march, let's see, uh, Sherman made Savannah's headquarters. Uh, Stanton shared a transcript of the discussion uh, with Henry Ward Beecher, brother of Harry uh, uh, Beecher Stowe, who in turn read it to his congregation and, and it was published in the New York Daily Tribune February 13th of 1865. Stanton told Beecher, quote, for the first time in the history of this nation, the representatives of the government had gone to the poor, debased people to ask them what they wanted for themselves, end quote. Stanton and Sherman posed 12 questions to this group of black ministers, one of which was, what do you want for your own people in the aftermath of the war? One of the members, uh, Reverend Garrison Fraser, answered, land, quote, 
the way we can best take care of ourselves is to have land and turn it and till it by our own labor. And we can soon maintain ourselves and have something to spare. We want to be placed on land until we are able to buy it and make it our own, end quote. And when asked next where the freed slaves would, would quote, quote, rather live, whether scattered among the whites or in colonies by themselves, Frazier replied that, quote, I would prefer to live by ourselves, for there is a prejudice against us in the South that will take years to get over. Years. Centuries. <laughs> I should have said centuries, but he just thought it would just be years. Um, um, in uh, March, Congress established um, the Freedmen's Bureau. I won't go, go, go into that. Two years later, uh, uh, Pennsylvania Congressman Thaddeus Stevens had introduced a bill uh, which didn't pass, uh, but that was, that was to grant 40 acres uh, and $50 to every former slave who was head of a household. Again, that's to say that questions of reparations were being thought about and talked about at this moment. Uh, so Field Order 15 reserves the, the strip of coastline uh, from Charleston uh, uh, to the St. John's River in Florida, uh, including the Georgia Sea Islands, um, and abandoned rice fields 30 miles inland from the coast uh, for free people. Um, Section 2 of the, of the order specified that these new communities, moreover, would be governed entirely by black people themselves. Uh, um, uh, the third section specified uh, the allocation of lands, that each family would have a plot of not more than 40 acres of uh, tillable ground. Uh, by June, uh, 40,000 freed, freed men had been settled on roughly 400,000 acres of quote-unquote Sherman land. Um, uh, Sherman later ordered that the army could lend the new settlers mules. Um, so even though African Americans had begun to settle on these lands without much assistance from the Freedmen's Bureau, uh, as we know, Johnson had other ideas and accepted loyalty oaths uh, and an agreement to, ex uh, to accept the 13th Amendment in exchange for reclaiming their land. Um, many African Americans from Georgia and South Carolina protested this reversal by questioning the federal government's understandings of loyalty and the very idea of Republican citizenship. And I say Republican with a small r. Where am I at the time? Am I good? I think I'm good. No, I think I'm not good. Uh, <laughs> so let me just hurry this along a bit um, to give my colleague ample time. Um, so after the Civil War and for much of Reconstruction, Atlanta, like the entire South, spent much of its, ener uh, its energies corralling ex-slaves. As historian William Link put it, the Freedmen's Bureau, quote, uh, the, the Freedmen's Bureau's policies toward urban ex-slaves combined relief and forced labor, end quote. While they were denied land, uh, which was certainly aid in the creation of wealth, potentially for generations, the freedmen were also forced to work. Now, we have to think about work differently at this moment than we do now, right? So we tend to think about labor as something that we all have to do. This, this is what you do as you work. Uh, but we have to be mindful that these were a group of folks who were owned as commodities for the purpose of working, right? For someone else. And so come, come, come freedom, right? They didn't really want to work for somebody else, right? They wanted leisure, right? Uh, uh, they didn't want to engage in these contracts, right? Contract, this wasn't a good, wasn't a good thing. They didn't want these contracts because it bounded them in a way, right? Again, uh, this was a marked definition of freedom. Um, a, Northern Army officer, a Northern Army officer, uh, uh, Captain Charles Solwick, who, who had captained the Black Regiment during the war, lectured free people in uh, South Carolina on what it meant to be free. I think this is really useful here. He said, quote, you are now free, but you must know that the only difference you can feel yet between slavery and freedom is that neither you nor your children can be bought or sold. If you ask for a half of the crop, or even a third, you ask too much. You wish to get more than you could get if you had been free all your lives. Do not ask for Saturday either. Free people everywhere, uh, everywhere else work Saturday." End quote. Captain Sowell went to place capitalism at the heart of his understandings of American freedom. Quote, you do not understand why some of the white people who used to own you 
do not have to work in the field. It is because they are rich. If every man were poor and worked in the field, there would be no big farms and very little cotton or corn raised to sell. There would be no money and nothing to buy. Some people must be rich to pay the others, and they have the right to do no work except to look out after their property. It is so everywhere, and perhaps by hard work, some of you may by and by become rich yourselves." End quote. This is, I, I would argue, right, was a common notion of, again, what to do with the free people, what to do with these folks who are now not forced to work. How can we provide a co confidence to northern industrialists who might want to invest that there is going to be some labor around, right? This looks different in the city, though. It looks a bit different in the city. And then here's where service work comes in, uh, for, and certainly for barbers. And thinking about um, uh, uh, the work of barbers in Atlanta, it's important to think about uh, secondary economies, right? So barbers were thinking about the secondary economies. And so there were businessmen who were, you know, again, this, sort of boosters of Atlanta and looking to build and expand and invest and so forth. Lots of people running about the city. Folks who need shaves, right? And barbers sort of placed themselves in this sort of secondary economy. Uh, in 1870, only about 3% of African Americans owned property, uh, 311 black men and about 27 black women. Uh, Robert Webster was um, the only black person with personal and real wealth valued at over $5,000. He had a total state of approximately $6,000. Um, according to uh, uh, James Russell, quote, the mean wealth of mulattoes uh, 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 by racial folks was about 70% greater than that of blacks, dark-skinned folks in antebellum America. Uh, the Atlanta City Directory for 1870 lists five uh, barbershops operated by black men. Um, uh, 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 Cobb, who I mentioned earlier, had a shop located on 11th and uh, Decatur Street. John Combs and Lewis operated a shop on 91 Whitehall. Uh, and a relative of Cobb, uh, Henry Cobb, had another shop just down the street on 82nd and Whitehall. Um, Nash's shop was on Mitchell between Broad and Forsyth. Uh, William Doherty Hutchins' uh, shop was on 4th and Alabama. Robert Webster wasn't listed as owning a shop, but he was listed as working as a barber on 17th and Whitehall. I'm not quite sure who owned this shop. Um, now, black, again, black barbers were not forced into contracts like their working class brethren, but they were forced into a contract of a different sort. Their freedom was defined by a racial contract. So amidst the sort of topsy-turvy changes during reconstruction, pieces of the old order were welcomely carried over into the new. And so I'm going to talk about Herndon for a brief moment uh, and, 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 and further clarify what I mean by this racial contract. Herndon uh, was born in 1858 um, in Walton County, Georgia. At age 20, he moved to Covington uh, and worked as a farmhand while cutting hair uh, on Saturday afternoons. We are in a small shop, uh, a small space in the town's black section to learn the trade of barbering. Um, he migrated to an emerging city of Atlanta to groom its elite. In 1882, he had settled in Atlanta where he worked as a German barber in Hutchins, Marietta Street Barbershop. Hutchins, as I mentioned, was one of the few black barbers uh, who owned a shop in Atlanta pre the Civil War. Uh, when Herndon arrived there, the city directory listed the, about 28 barbershops. Uh, 23 of them were black owned. Um, within six months, Herndon had purchased 50% uh, interest in Hutchins' shop. Uh, he would eventually open his own shop and several others uh, across Atlanta. Um, Herndon, though, I would argue, sort of learned early on that grooming former Confederates and carpetbaggers required a public deferential demeanor. While it's difficult to know exactly what his patrons thought, the racial and paternal politics of the period suggest the line between competent businessmen and affectionate servant were blurred. He says, quote, I came to Atlanta with the determination to, to, to succeed, and by careful, conscious work and tactful, polite conduct. So, being polite for Herndon and being tactful was essential to servicing a white market. White Southerners highlighted these qualities when speaking of black barbers. The Atlanta Constitution uh, acknowledged uh, the death of William Betts in 1901. Uh, Betts had worked as a barber in Atlanta for over 40 years. He partnered with Herndon uh, to own shops on both Whitehall and Lloyd Streets. The newspaper finally recalled that Betts was, quote, polite and appreciative. He had no false ideas about the greatness of his race. 
he looked upon the man he shaved as his friend and gave himself entirely to his occupation, always polite to the white man and never uh, obtruding upon his superiors, end quote. So being polite seems central to any service business. However, whites perceived politeness and deference when attached to black service as signs of inferiority. And this is indeed the racial contract. So in fact, this was part of the fantasy of white that white patrons paid for. So former Confederates right, sat in the black barber's chair for shaves and had an inflated sense of themselves as superior men, then black barbers stood above them poised to take their money. And indeed, and I'm not going to say, say, say more about, about Herndon, but I just want to end here by talking briefly about the Civil Rights Act of 1875, because that's indeed, I argue, where we get to, again, where the, both the state and the market were coming together to think about questions of freedom. Now, the push for the Civil Rights Act of 75 uh, was to, to prohibit um, discrimination um, um, in public places of accommodations, right? Hotels, restaurants, etc. The irony here was that once the act was passed, uh, many African Americans would use the Civil Rights Act of 1875 to protest against black barbers who were grooming white men and excluding black men from their shops, right? Uh, and so Webster was one of them. Uh, and when called, right, when sort of pushed, Webster uh, responded by saying, quote, I keep a barber shop for white men, have shaved no Negroes, and even under the Civil Rights Bill, no Negro can have his face <coughs> scraped or his wool oiled in my shop. I'm a colored man, but still, I am a white man in principle. And I want my colored friends to know that in their places, I am their friend, and that out of their places, I am not their friend. Um, white barbershop patrons drew on the rhetoric of social equality to object to interracial public intimacy and consumer equality. Black barbershops were spaces of consumption and leisure where whites exercised their power as whites, as men, and consumers. For them, the plane of social equality stretched horizontally, right, between consumers as opposed to vertically between consumer and producer, or barber in this case. By marking the barbershop as a private space, white consumers protected the social intimacy they enjoyed while hanging out there. Yet one person's privacy is, equals another person's exclusion. By adhering to white patrons' desires of racial exclusivity, color line barbers ran the risk of blurring the line between business and racial deference. Barbers advertised their services to a white public who made no distinctions between the requisites of a service transaction and the requirements of servitude. White consumption and the leisure economy was undergirded with privacy claims to promulgate the fears of social equality. So by opposing the Civil Rights Act, color line barbers guarded their individual economic interests under the umbrella of privacy claims, which proved highly toxic to African Americans' collective interests in equal rights to public spaces. And indeed, uh, it's useful, I think, for us to begin to think a bit about, again, beyond wage labor contracts, to think about uh, the ways in which contracts and racial contracts were essential in uh, black entrepreneurs' efforts to eke out some sense of independence. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mills. It's amazing what you can learn by uh, visiting the barber shop. That's not a joke. It's, uh, it's a pleasure for me next to uh, uh, quickly introduce my friend and colleague, uh, George Tech in our history, School of History and Sociology, Douglas Flaming. He was a co-organizer of today's events. Uh, he's an award-winning teacher, award-winning scholar. He's written books that have to do with African-American history and the history of the South. That's enough said. Welcome. Thank you, Steve. Chris, I do have a paper here I'd like to distribute. No, no, not distribute. Look at. Okay. So you just show me what to push. Good afternoon. 
Nice to see you. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure to be on the panel. It's always good to hear Quincy speak. My mind is a whirl with thoughts. This talk will be a little different than some that I've given at this university in that it will be driven by PowerPoint slides <laughs> rather than by words. This is a dangerous proposition for someone like me. It's also unique in that this will be the first time I've ever figured out how to work the timer on my iPhone 6. <laughs> and so I'm going to start it. And at the, it says when the timer ends, crickets will sound. <laughs> so if you hear crickets, oh well, you get the point. <laughs> And is, here we go. It says start. Oh my goodness. The title of my paper today, which I want you to focus on the subtitle, that's really what I want us to look at. How Atlanta rebuilt <laughs> and for whom. That is to say, in, whom, in, in whose interest was the city rebuilt. And I want to uh, go through uh, a variety of answers, three answers to that question in the process of my talk today. In 1837, not far from here, someone drove that iron stake into the red Georgia clay and from that was built a railroad town and that railroad town became Atlanta and by the 1850s the City Council of Atlanta had a seal and on its seal was a locomotive and that was accurate it was a railroad town and they made no bones about it what is a railroad a railroad is the Industrial Revolution incarnate. A railroad is red Georgia clay on boots. A railroad is real strong hands around hard wood swinging an eight pound sledge. A railroad is coal burning in a furnace boiling water, forcing steam through pipes to unspeakable pressures that turn a wheel, that turn another wheel, that turn another wheel. A railroad is soot and smoke and cinder and gravel. A railroad is down and dirty real. It's as real as you could get in the mid 19th century. Beyond the tracks, what is a railroad? A railroad was the art of the deal, the fountain pen steel, the land grab, the political handshake, the bourbon and cigar cabal, the fretting over freight rates, the understanding and the growing mentality that what made a city was an artery of movement that brought in commerce, goods, and people into town and out of town and into town and out of town. A railroad was a very real thing, and a railroad was also a way of thinking <clears throat> about what Atlanta was. So this was a very good seal in the railroad made Atlanta and the railroad brought its destruction. This is the post-war seal of the city. We're all familiar with it. 
resurgence, the phoenix rising from the ashes. In this seal, in this image of the city, we have something that is quite literally unreal. A phoenix doesn't get red Georgia clay on its boots because there can't be a phoenix. The ashes don't exist except in our mind. The flames aren't in a railroad furnace or a boiler. It's an idea, the phoenix. Let's even use the Latin, resurgence. I've tried in vain to determine whether there's an actual Latin opposite to the word resurgence. I haven't found one, but you can. And when you do, <coughs> send me an email. <laughs> It's a city, therefore, of contrast, and that is the first point I want to make. If we are going to look long and hard at Atlanta, we have to look at the contrast of the railroad city of cinders and soot and smoke and the mythic ideals of the phoenix reborn. We have to look at both the prosperity of the city and the poverty of the city. We have to look at the despair of the city and the hope of the city. We have to look at the opportunities of the city and the oppression of the city. We have to consider matters such as this. Atlanta developed a reputation as a town for good conditions for race relations and yet was headed directly toward the white on black race riot of 1906. It's a city of contrasts and contradictions. Today I want to answer that subtitle, How and For Whom. And I want to do so by giving three brief answers to the question, how did Atlanta do it? And each answer I hope, will suggest to you an answer to the question, for whom? And I hope will also complicate the answer, for whom? So keep in mind these two seals, the city of, of contrast, which I think actually exists even until yet. In the end, I will try to nail the past and the present together. And I'm going to ask a very big question about resilience in a city, resilience in this city. How did Atlanta rebuild? Point number one, massive use of unfree labor. The convict lease system. That went too far. Let's go back. <laughs> to understand the convict lease system, you must have a thumbnail sketch of the penitentiary system of the state. Prior to the Civil War, there was a very small state pen in Milledgeville uh, that uh, housed very few white inmates and almost no African American inmates. After the Civil War, very shortly after the Civil War, even during Radical Reconstruction, the state penitentiary became flooded with inmates who were almost all African American, and most of whom were there on charges of petty theft. But there's a problem if you're the state of Georgia and if you're the city of Atlanta. You need to rebuild. You don't need to be spending money for people to be housed at a penitentiary. So what do you do? 
You don't create, uh, what they did not do is to create an industrial wing within the penitentiary and have inmates go to it and build things. What they did instead was to lease out the convicts for inexpensive prices to those who needed very cheap labor. And there's no sugarcoating it. This was a sadistic system. The Chattahoochee Brick Company. Almost every brick that built Atlanta after the war, rising phoenix-like from the ashes, was made by the Chattahoochee Brick Company and virtually every worker there by the thousands over the years, male and female, was African American and convict lease. This meant that the state got money from Chattahoochee Brick Company and Chattahoochee Brick Company got workers at pennies a day. It meant that Atlanta got bricks at a deep discount. How did Atlanta's, by the way, there it is. There it is, that's the letterhead. It's not a backhanded business, right? It's not, uh, it's not a shady proposition. It's an incorporated brick company with letterhead that does business that makes millions of bricks. That's run by James W. English, president, former mayor of Atlanta. And it's big. And it made bricks by the millions. And it paid pennies per worker per day. How did Atlanta's railroads get rebuilt? so fast? How did new railroads get built so fast? Convict lease. Virtually every ra major railroad repair and every major railroad project had the land graded, the lumber cut, the lumber placed, the rails placed, the spikes driven by convict lease labor. This is a rock quarry. You need gravel for a railroad. And one way you get gravel is you have people go into quarries and break rocks into gravel. These are convicts. They have on the traditional striped convict suit. Companies that used convict lease had their obligations. Room, which was often a caged uh, well, okay, board, which was food, uninspected, and they were obligated to discipline their convicts. In other words, the state was not controlling them. The companies that leased them were controlling them. This is Joe Brown, mean Joe Brown. <coughs> Joe Brown, he's a mighty mean man, as the song went. Joe Brown was governor of Confederate Georgia, and even then he was a mighty curmudgeon, as Jeff Davis would tell you. Uh, later on, he would become a senator, uh, and uh, his son would be a double governor. Joseph Brown had perhaps the most notorious convict lease system set up. In, uh, way up in northwestern Georgia, where it's still hard to get, uh, Dade County. How many of you have been to Dade County in the last year? We've got a couple. Now that is good. That's a high percentage, generally speaking. Did you just raise your hand? I thought we had three. It's not easy to get there. You have to want to get there. Uh, 
in Dade County, there's a small vein of coal that cuts across, and in that area there is where Joseph Brown had his coke and coal and pig iron complex, and it was a big one. And so Joseph Brown leased convicts um, and did so on a large scale. They mined the coal, and then they turned the coal into coke in big, in big coke ovens, and then they handed over uh, the ore to be worked by free white workers in, who produced pig iron. Uh, when the white workers got, would get honorary and go on strike, uh, then the convicts would be used, brought in to, uh, to take their place there as, as well. What's my point? My point is that unfree labor went a long way toward rebuilding the Phoenix, uh, uh, rebuilding Atlanta, toward uh, uh, having Atlanta rise from the ashes. It rose from the ashes in part because there were discount bricks. There was discount pig iron. There was discount everything, coal. And there were a few gigantic fortunes made because uh, of the convict lease system. How bad was it? Well, when the chain gang labor, that became law in 1908, that was a progressive upgrade reform from convict lease. That's the police force. Now, if a former mayor who has political connections and works at Chattahoochee Brick Company, owns it, is the president, he wants more convicts, yeah. well, if a US senator, Joseph Brown, has a massive complex of convict lease labor way out beyond Atlanta that Atlantans can't see out of sight, out of mind, and he needs more convicts. Well, fortunes get made and they make, as my son would say, they make bank. I like this picture. It doesn't actually say which bank it is. These, these, most of these photos are from uh, the Georgia, uh, 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 the, the Georgia archives, uh, digital online photographs. You can, you can look them up. This one says the bank is unidentified. I'm sure an architectural uh, uh, historian or someone who knows uh, Atlanta on the ground level would be able to tell you what bank it is. But I kind of like it because it just says bank. And um, that's kind of where the money is. Can you tell that I worked really hard? <laughs> no, but I did. Because it took a long time for me to get those green arrows on there and have them be transparent. And um, so thank you very much. Now, thank you. No, 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 no. Look at these. Now, are they confident? Yeah, they got money. Yeah, they, are. Yeah, they have money. That's right. That, that's right. Now, now, here's a couple of caveats. Caveat A. Just because you were white didn't mean you were well off. There's an awful lot of poor whites who are having a real tough time right here in Atlanta. Caveat B is that there was a growing middle class of African Americans within Atlanta. As Atlanta became the cradle of African American education, a sweet Auburn business district began to, to grow. As freedmen's schools turned into other schools, city of contrast, 
Point number two, boosters. Yeah, boosters. Those breathless promoters of a city. Here's the most famous, Henry Grady, who at age 24 wandered into Atlanta and was offered a quarter interest in the Atlanta Constitution which was in this building there. And the Atlanta Constitution became one of the most forceful vehicles of public opinion, certainly white public opinion, in all of the former Confederacy. This is the classic picture of Grady, but I kind of like this informal one. Hands in his pocket, he's leaning on a uh, he's leaning on an ar uh, 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 a pillar there on a porch, and he knows something that you don't. <laughs> and he ought to, because at age 24, somebody loaned him $25,000 to buy his share of the Atlanta Constitution. That's a lot of money to loan somebody who's 24 who's basically made a name for writing one editorial called The New South. The idea of The New South began to burgeon, and Grady wrote it to the top. He even wrote it to New York, where he met with, I'm not making this up, the New England Club of New York City. I, I'm sorry, I'm from West Texas and I just can't imagine being in New York and being homesick for New England and having to have a club where you meet and drink and, 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 and weep about you know having left Boston. I just, the distances are too short. Uh, where was I? In Boston. In Boston. Thank <laughs> We have fallen in love with work, said Henry Grady. The old South, there was an old South of slavery. Thank God that world is dead. There is a new South of industry, of manufacturing, of commerce. That South, thank God, is alive and well. That's a near quote. New Englanders in New York, <coughs> New Yorkers in New England, they ate it up. Come on down. Invest in the South. We're not like we were. We don't apologize for the Confederacy. Grady said this many, many times. I'm not apologizing for the Confederacy. His father had died for the Confederacy. No apology for the past, but I won't stay in the past. The future is with manufacturing. The future is with industry. The future is with the city. The future is with my city, Atlanta. And there may be other upstarts like Macon and Augusta and Columbus and old-fashioned, old-minded Savannah. But Atlanta will carry the world and its shoulders into the late 19th century and will leave you in its dust. That was pretty good. I just kind of made that up. <laughs> he didn't actually say that. Now, Boosters are important. It's easy to, when you read booster rhetoric, as my students have to do in their history, in my history of the New South course, it gets funny after a while because boosters say the most outlandish things about how their city is the greatest thing since sliced bread. No wrong metaphor, there was not sliced bread, I don't think, at that time. But they get so enthusiastic and so wordy and so out of control in their rhetoric that it's funny. 
boosters are funny in the end. Booster rhetoric, just a after a while, you just, oh. But it's also true that in what we might call the primary economy, somebody has to step up and do it. Somebody has to move a city forward. And that has to be people who are willing to get out there and make trips to New York and rustle up capital and create newspapers that try to change the mentality of an entire region and that eventually organize a series of exhibitions or world's fairs that bring people from all over the world and all over the country to Atlanta to showcase Henry Grady's New South. Here's the most famous of those exhibitions, expositions, easy for you to say, the <laughs> Atlanta Exposition of 1895. Famous for its size, famous for the fact that it uh, that it was it put Atlanta in the front of virtually every other uh, New South city. Uh, famous for the fact that that's where Booker T. Washington gave his Atlanta Compromise speech. And now it's Piedmont Park, which is in the direction, let's see, there, <laughs> there. The lake is still there. Somebody had to do that, round up the money to do that, and put it on. Stroke of genius. Exposition of 95, the plunge. A boat goes down, hits the water, the lake's still there, the plunge is gone. I say we raise a movement to bring back <laughs> the plunge. Sorry, I had to put that in. Uh, and sorry, I had to put this one in. You see, the exposition is here, and the city is still burning. <laughs> uh, this was a reenactment, uh, a complete lie. I have no idea what that is, and I'm sure it brought sorrow, and I'm sorry. Henry Grady died uh, fairly young, uh, and it wasn't long before Atlanta raised uh, a statue in memory of him. And as you can see, the crowd is small and unenthusiastic. <laughs> no, they loved it. He was there, Henry Grady. And Atlanta was becoming a celebrity city. And if it's not a celebrity city, I don't know what is. That's still there. I worked hard on that arrow. But it's not transparent. <laughs> No, I didn't want it to be transparent. I wanted it to give a sense of, I, I don't know. <laughs> now, while I sing the praises of Henry Grady as the city did, I will remind you that this is a city of contrast and that point number one was, con was convict lease labor on free labor. And Henry Grady was the kingmaker who put Joe Brown, as in Joe Brown's Dade County Coke and Coal Company, into the Senate. Grady and Brown and their pal Evan Howell had similar investments, many investments in companies that made their fortunes through the convict lease system. And you might ask yourself, or you might ask me, Professor Fleming, what was Henry Grady's view on race? And I would say to you, that's Georgia Tech students. They're always asking the right questions. Thank you, Georgia Tech students. <laughs> that is the right question. When he was in New England, he met the issue head on. No, he was in New York talking to New Englanders. He met the issue head on. And his view was, don't worry about it, we'll take care of it. Not your problem anymore, we'll take care of it. We understand the race problem. 
You never will. We understand it. Leave it to us. But he went further in Dallas, Texas, at the Texas State Fair the next year, when he gave an address called the Problem of the South, in which he made very clear that in his view, white supremacy was absolutely essential to the process of rebuilding his city. And I'm quoting now from that speech. Quote, those who would put the Negro race in supremacy would work against infallible decree, for the white race can never submit to its domination because the white race is the superior race. But the supremacy of the white race of the South must be maintained forever and the domination of the Negro race resisted at all points and at all hazards because the white race is the superior race. This is the declaration of no new truth. It has abided forever in the marrow of our bones and shall run forever with the blood that feeds Anglo-Saxon hearts." Unquote. Point number three, there was another economy besides the primary economy, what Quincy called the secondary economy. And this is where outsiders don't just stand outside and look in, but outsiders find nooks and crannies within the secondary economy and make their way in it. And I want to highlight briefly two groups that I characterize as in the New South, the New Atlanta economy, outsiders who became innovators. On the left, this uh, represents African Americans in the city, the African American middle class. And this is a picture of their building uh, and black leaders of the city at their uh, at the Exposition of 1895. The group at the Negro Building Atlanta Exposition. They had to petition to have a building to be represented, but they got it at last. And they chose segregation, or perhaps we should say congregation, over exclusion. And they did have their own building and there were those cutting across the color line and there were those working that secondary economy. Another group represented on this, the slide on the right would be Jewish immigrants. Most of them from Eastern Europe, most of them mid 19th century uh, immig immigrants who had uh, one way or another wound up in Georgia, including uh, Silverman's company, this classic, classic picture of the Silverman's interior includes Silverman's baby lions. He was going to buy them, but they were expensive, so he rented them. <laughs> but if I went into a store and I saw baby lions, I'd buy something. <laughs> Here's another picture I like of the secondary economy. This is a market. And these are African American consumers. And I'm just guessing, I don't know, but I'm guessing this is a Sunday afternoon because the hats look great. Uh, they're in their finery. The sun's out. And there's, they're at, people are at leisure. And they're buying and selling not in a corner brick store, but in little stalls, not unlike a farmer's market we see today. I also like this picture because the railroad is right there. In case you missed it, that's a locomotive. That's number 15, and it's a coming through. You find the gaps you can. 
for the most part, uh, to a large degree, Jewish immigrants uh, were able to assimilate into Southern life, name changes, the Reich brothers became the Rich Brothers, uh, for example, uh, but uh, not all the way. Um, I, like, I just like this slide, and the, history, the School of History and Sociology has a, has a specialization in the history of sports, so I thought I have to work this in. Uh, so I did. Uh, the Jewish Progressive Club basketball uh, team. And then you can ask yourself, you, you can go down to Oakland Cemetery and you can ask yourself, well, why is there a separate Jewish section? So there was assimilation, but only up to a point. Jacob Elsis developed from a small shop, a massive factory complex, the Fulton Bag and Cotton Mills, which is still there today, down in the Fourth Ward, hired exclusively white workers, as Southern textile mills did. Elsus did, in fact, try to change that. He tried to bring in a group of African American women to be folders and packers. 1,500 white workers rioted as a result and Elsus stopped that experiment. So poor whites to this factory, which would become the heart of Cabbage Town, and now the heart of, well, now it's condominiums that, that we can't buy. Rich's department store, that's the, the Rich brothers that came over from Hungary uh, in the 1850s. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and uh, they settled in Ohio, and they were not eligible for the draft in the Union Army when the war started because they were not citizens, and they did not, they were wise enough, I suppose, not to volunteer. Uh, instead, they became uh, major uh, traders or, uh, you know, Get a wagon and get a horse, haul stuff, sell it. Save the money. There's a good book on, on Richards. It's, it's, it's pretty recent. It's on, uh, and I recommend it. It's, an, it's, it's a sweet little read. But it has a point that says, after the war, then the Rich brothers <coughs> moved to Georgia. Well, there's a lot of places you could move. Uh, why Georgia? I don't know. I'll find out one of these days, or perhaps someone here can. You don't know. We don't, we don't know. Uh, well, one, uh, some brothers picked Albany, Georgia, Albany, Georgia, and others picked Atlanta. Uh, Atlanta won that contest. They wound up in Atlanta, building bigger and uh, bigger dry goods stores. Uh, setting prices at an even rate, uh, that is to say, uh, putting a price tag on a dry good and saying this is the price, there's no, there's no bargaining, you don't have to come in, you know the price, uh, getting good rates from railroads, <coughs> putting up shop right by the railroad, uh, or the back side to the railroad and the front side to, to the street. This is actually the, the much larger store that the Rich Brothers built. It became famous for its corner, uh, street corner clock, which said Riches on it. And Riches department store then became a kind of southern institution that would be known in the late 20th century by the chirping of the crickets. <laughs> How do you stop it? You can't. <laughs> Alonzo Herndon. We don't need to, I don't need to tell you about Alonzo Herndon now, but I, here's the picture of the man on the top left. I think I've actually cropped him out of this picture. The Atlanta uh, life insurance uh, 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 employees and office. And then, of course, uh, the expanded 
uh, version. And oh my goodness, there's Georgia Tech. I'm sorry, I had to put it in. I had to put it in. Um, but Atlanta boosters were very influential in calling for Georgia Tech. Uh, there's the Tech Tower without the T to be stolen. These are Georgia Tech students ready to steal the T once it gets up there. And uh, yeah, I put that as a completely gratuitous thing. Now, this brings us, since the crickets have chirped and this, we're almost done, I bring us to the very big, very complicated, absolutely essential question. That sounds like a Dr. Seuss book, doesn't it? The very big, very... Here's the question. Can a resilient city, can this resilient city move ahead in such a way that there's equal opportunity and equal justice for all. Part of me is skeptical because of the past and because of the present, because of the global rise of nationalist movements, the expanded openness and violence of anti-Semitic groups and anti-black groups and nationalist groups everywhere. So part of me is thinking, I don't know. I don't know if we can do it. But then another part of me looks at this. We have a new soccer team in, club, in town, and by golly, they play sweet soccer. This is Grant Field, which is right out there, and we are sitting in a room about right here. All right, so if you follow this bank around, we're, we're about here in this picture. Now, before the very first home game, a giant golden railroad spike was put in front of the stadium and all the players signed it. Yep. And then all the original season ticket holders signed it. And that's it. Mm -hmm. And this is taken... This is not my word, this is taken directly from the website last night, so it's up to date. Sporting the red and black stripes, hip hop artist, actor, and well recognized ATLian, young jock emerged from the darkness carrying a hammer, prepared to strike the golden spike for the very first time, which he did to untold pandemonium. <laughs> brilliant. After the first game was over, it was a loss. It, but the lads tried hard. The Atlanta United player who does the best, the player of the game, gets as a reward a golden spike. The golden spike award. It's good old Arthur Blank. Joseph Martinez. If you don't know who he is now, you will. Dude is a scoring machine. He got the golden spike the second game. After the first game, the person who scored the first goal, <coughs> somebody help me, who scored the first goal in the first game? Thank you. Emil Assad was given the golden spike. And did he keep it and put it in his trophy room? Friend, he did not. He walked out to the rail in the wood and took a hammer and he pounded it in. Not a real gold spike, I mean, it's iron. <laughs> this is the second home game. 
Martinez takes his golden spike and drives it in. And I will read this in case you can't read it. In 1837, a spike was, I'm quoting, this is from the website. I'm quoting this. I'm not making this up. In 1837, a spike was driven into Georgia's red clay leading to the formation of a city. Now, another spike is driven into the ground, signifying the birth of a movement, the connection to the world, the uniting of cultures, generations, and backgrounds. Let the golden spike be a reminder of our beginnings and our rise as a city and a club. An everlasting <laughs> tradition is officially born in the ATL. They moved that spike five years later. Which is it going to be? Which is it going to be? As we move forward, as we try to connect the past and the present, as we try to use the past as a foundation upon which to build a better city for everyone concerned, which way Atlanta? <coughs> Convict lease, golden spike. I believe the answer to that question is up to us. Thank you. turns on actually. Uh, we have a panel now uh, on reconstructing memories, thinking about uh, how we and, and perhaps generations just before us uh, have looked back on the Civil War. Uh, at the request of the two speakers, we are going to dispense of uh, any sort of extended introductions. You have biographies uh, in the playbills. We're running a little bit late. Uh, we are going to hear from uh, Wendy Bennett, uh, who, by the way, has a book on uh, commercial development in a uh, well-received book on commercial development during this period in uh, Atlanta. And uh, she's going to start off with a talk on the Atlantans Remember the Civil War. And then we're going to hear from Jamil, the uh, president of the Georgia Humanities Council. Uh, and there is no misspelling in his title, and he will explain it uh, when he gets going. And let's just immediately turn this over to Wendy. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I want to thank Cy and Doug for organizing the conference, and Mary Lou and Chris for their help with logistics, and all of you for coming. It's really been very interesting. I've been copiously taking notes and just a, a brief word to those of you who are students who might be looking for topics. Uh, you should be getting lots of good ideas from what you're hearing at this conference. 
Uh, many records of Atlanta were destroyed during the Civil War through the bombing or the firing or just the, the mayhem in the city. But one of the really good sets of records that have remained are the cemetery records. So the Atlanta History Center has the cemetery records so we know who died, what their names are, how old they were, and their believed cause of death. So there is a big project for someone who wants to, to, to uh, investigate uh, illness and death in Atlanta during the Civil War. Uh, we heard this morning about the rich collection about the Freedmen's Bureau that's located at the archives. No one's really done anything with those papers. And then to just uh, briefly reference Quincy's talk, um, I've looked at the papers of Benjamin Yancey, who owned Robert Webster the Barber, uh, and, and those papers are at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and they are fascinating. Huge collection of papers having to do with those two men before, during, and after the Civil War. And again, there are many stories to tell, many questions to, to answer, ask, and many avenues to explore. So get out there and start studying. All right, so I am now writing a book about the way Atlantans have remembered the Civil War since 1865. And so far, I've written three draft chapters. So what I'm going to give you this afternoon is a brief excerpt of the chapter about the lost cause and the chapter about sectional reconciliation. The second chapter is about Henry Grady, who gets his own chapter. And then starting this summer, I'll start investigating the 20th century. But I haven't started delving into that period yet. In 1894, the Reverend Edward R. Carter published a book called The Black Side, recounting Atlanta's history before, during, and after the Civil War. Born a slave in Athens, Georgia, Carter moved to Atlanta, where he eventually became the pastor of Friendship Baptist Church. In his book, Carter bemoaned the suffering of white Atlanta residents during the war and concluded the loss on the white side was great. However, he celebrated the war's liberation of slaves. The shells of General Sherman were the strokes of the hammer of liberty, unfastening the fetters of the accursed and inhuman institution of slavery. In a nutshell, the Reverend Carter captured the differing view of the war by white and black Atlantans. Whites focused on loss, while blacks focused on liberty. The historian David Blight has argued that there were three interpretations of the Civil War that emerged in the United States after 1865. In the South, former Confederates defended a lost cause that ennobled those who fought and died. A second interpretation held by African Americans North and South <coughs> argued for an emancipationist narrative that emphasized a war that ended slavery and offered the potential for blacks to enjoy rights of citizenship. Over time, the prevailing narrative, North and South, was what Blight called the reconciliationist one, in which soldiers and civilians on both sides of the conflict embraced the theme of national healing. Often ignored in this interpretation, were the war's causes and the fate of African Americans during and after the war. Events in Atlanta largely conform to Blight's model. After the war, white Atlantans began, began a process by which they <coughs> interpreted the war not as a fight over states' rights and slavery, but strictly as a fight over how to interpret the U.S. Constitution. And Atlantans added another issue of equal import. They focused on the image of their brave little city coping with General Sherman's invasion and bombardment. Atlanta's capture, the expulsion of its white civilians, and its partial destruction. In sum, they focused on Atlanta's victimization by General Sherman. Now here's the point that I want to make. Atlanta was victimized by General Sherman. It is terrible that our city was bombarded for five weeks terrible that its white civilians were forced to leave, and terrible that our city was partially destroyed. But by focusing on Atlanta's victimization and on the lost cause, white Atlantans in the post-war period left out important parts of the story. 
In reality, the city was deeply divided over whether to support secession in 1860. In reality, economic struggles and social turmoil characterized Atlanta after 1863. And in reality, slavery played a major role in causing the war and in the war itself. And these are all topics that I explored in my 2014 book called A Changing Wind. Atlanta was a smoldering ruin when William T. Sherman's army left the city in November of 1864. And the speed with which Atlantans rebuilt their city is a story that is both true and in many respects, although not as we have just been reminded in all respects. But at the same time that they rebuilt their city, Atlantans had to confront the recent past. At least 620,000 soldiers north and south died during the Civil War, and an estimated 50,000 civilians. The historian Drew Faust, who's now also the president of Harvard University, has written that the United States embarked on a new relationship with death as they coped as a republic of suffering. Throughout the South, groups of women began to gather annually to decorate the graves of fallen soldiers as members of ladies' memorial associations. And in a very short time, there were some 70 ladies' memorial associations in the South. This is actually a picture of Virginia because I couldn't find a picture of Atlanta. So the Atlanta Ladies Memorial Association began in June of 1866 with the goal of decorating graves at Oakland Cemetery, which was originally called City Cemetery. Several thousand soldiers were buried there, including those who died in Atlanta's 26 Confederate hospitals. From the beginning, the ALMA wanted to remember and honor Confederate dead, but also had a political intent. Before its members decorated a single grave, they invited Robert Alston to address the members. Robert Alston, who was a former cavalry commander who rode with John Hunt Morgan, uh, gave a speech to the ALMA in which he paid homage to the South's fallen heroes who fought for the preservation in its original purity of the Constitution. Alston castigated the radical majority which now rules our land, which was a reference to the radical Republicans in Congress who had not actually quite yet wrested control over Reconstruction from President Andrew Johnson. Nonetheless, Alston bemoaned this, quote, march of fanaticism. And of course, this is a women's organization. So when you have a women's organization and you have a rather inflammatory speaker, you can kind of pretend that it's not political, right? Because women are not supposed to be involved in politics. And we even know that on at least one occasion, General Meade, who was, represent, uh, who was uh, talked about by Charlie this morning, came to one of these ceremonies. It's not political. This, these are women. Not, not quite true. Well, over time, the ALMA took on a quasi-official status. Every year, Atlanta's mayor would issue a proclamation telling people in the city to visit Oakland Cemetery on April 26th, designated as Confederate Memorial Day, and to, quote, unite with the ladies of the Memorial Association in doing honor to our martyrs whose lifeblood washed upon the altar of our liberties, as one mayor put it. So every year, thousands of Atlantans would go out to the cemetery encouraged to do so by the mayor and the city council and also the business community who gave their employees a half holiday as part of their way of encouraging them to go. Most of the members of the ALMA were affluent women, many of whom had been volunteer nurses during the Civil War, and they raised a lot of money. They held strawberry festivals, they held skating parties, and they also placed collection boxes at the cemetery in order to raise additional funds. In addition to decorating graves annually, they raised money for two monuments that are both still there at Oakland Cemetery. Uh, the first of them was, uh, the cornerstone was laid in 1870, and it's an obelisk, which is an ancient symbol for eternal life. Uh, but in 1869, they had raised enough money to begin the process of disinterring 
the bodies of dead cons Confederate soldiers who were buried in shallow graves around where the fighting occurred in Atlanta and to reinter them at Oakland Cemetery. So eventually they were able to rebury some 3,000 unidentified soldiers. And in perhaps their most ambitious project, they erected a massive monument to honor the memory of these 3,000 dead. Based on a famous statue in Switzerland called the Lion of Lucerne, the Lion of Atlanta was made from the largest piece of quarried stone ever excavated in the United States at the time that it was uh, unveiled in 1894. And I don't know if you can see it from where you are, but um, this is, it's, it's a lion that's reclining on a Confederate flag there's a stake driven through the lion's back, and of course it carries a, an expression of agony. And uh, underneath it says, unknown Confederate dead. At the 1894 dedication ceremony, Colonel John Millage, who was the dedicated marshal, designated marshal for the occasion, and who was the husband of the ALMA president, Fanny Millage, spoke of the solemn occasion that brings us together. And then he referenced General Sherman's expulsion of innocent civilians from the city in 1864 and the city's burning and destruction. Although the ALMA continued to play an important role in the annual celebrations of Confederate Memorial Day, it lost some of its influence when in 1886, Confederate veterans formed themselves into an organization called the Confederate Veterans Association of Fulton County. Charter members included the aforementioned John Millage, the um, Atlanta Constitution's co-owner William A. Hemphill, and former Mayor William Louds Calhoun, who became its president and who is pictured here. Thereafter, the ALMA arranged flowers while the veterans selected the speaker. And if the women objected to this, they did so out of the earshot of any reporters for any of the city newspapers. But eventually, of course, the vets started dying off and the women took back complete control over running these annual affairs. African Americans commemorated the Civil War uh, with their own occasions, very much separate from the white people. In the immediate aftermath of the Civil War, African Americans in Atlanta celebrated the 4th of July, which was a holiday that white people ignored in the South during the Civil War and after the Civil War. 1867 marched the, uh, marked the beginning of the Republican Party in the state of Georgia, and African Americans celebrated with banners, including one that read the birth of slavery, July 4th, 76, uh, the birth of liberty, July 4th, 76, the death of slavery, July 4th, 67. Uh, in the state of Georgia, the Republican Party consisted of African Americans who were enfranchised men, African American men, enfranchised by the state constitution of 1868, and yeoman farmers from North Georgia and the Wiregrass uh, region of South Georgia. However, Reconstruction did not last very long in Georgia, and so eventually the 4th of July evolved into a social holiday for African Americans. <coughs> Instead, blacks celebrated Emancipation Day annually on January 1st uh, the, to mark the occasion on which President Abraham Lincoln signed into law the Emancipation Proclamation. Emancipation Day festivities often took place in local churches, and included the reading of the proclamation by a prominent member of the community, along with speeches and music. Sometimes community leaders use these occasions in order to inform their constituents about political issues. As one example, at Lloyd Street Methodist Church in 1890, audience members passed resolutions condemning the recent lynching of three black men in Jessup, Georgia, near Brunswick. One resolution called upon white churches and white newspapers to denounce these outrages, though there is no evidence that they did so. Oftentimes, Emancipation Day festivities carried a positive message. At Atlanta University, 
Uh, on January 1st, 1894, a student by the name of Maddie Freeman Childs delivered an address called The Progress of Colored Women Since 1863. It concluded, suddenly snatched from the accursed bondage of slavery, placed in the blessed light of freedom with God as helper, we have patiently and arduously toiled, up toiled upward and tonight we can look in the face of any man and boldly say, we are rising. As a young professor at Atlanta University, W.E.B. Du Bois gave an Emancipation Day address at E.R. Carter's Friendship Baptist Church in 1900. In his address, he emphasized the importance of education and implored black parents to keep their children in school. He also emphasized the need for young black people to work hard and lead morally upright lives. At this point in his career, Du Bois had not yet broken with Booker T. Washington and his followers who emphasized self-help. In Atlanta, white and black authors provided dramatically different interpretations of the war. I've already talked about E.R. Carter's book, The Black Side. A few years after he published that book, which was 1894, in 1897, uh, a Decatur woman named Mary Gay published a memoir called Life in Dixie During the War. A white woman from a prominent local family, she wrote a volume that was a lost cause testimonial. Written 30 years after the Civil War ended, Life in Dixie begins with a spirited defense of the institution of slavery. Mary Gay uh, contended that slavery was good for white people and it was good for black people 30 years after. And during the war, she owned three slaves. As a single woman, she, she was legally allowed to own property. And two of them remained loyal, quote, quote, and she referred to them in the volume as our ebony confederates. And one of them ran away. <laughs> During the war, Mary Gay traveled frequently to Atlanta to nurse the sick and wounded in Atlanta's 26 Confederate hospitals, sometimes walking the seven miles between Decatur and Atlanta. Her descriptions of those experiences and her descriptions of the plight of civilian suffering during what she called the dark days of 64 make riveting, reason, uh, riveting reading. By the end of the war, civilians like Gay, her mother and sister-in-law, struggled to find food such that they were reduced to picking up kernels of corn left by the departing federal cavalry. The publication of Gay's volume made her a local celebrity and went through many reprintings, <coughs> and the book is still in print, I believe. In addition to Mary Gay, um, Atlanta women offered reminiscences about the home front as members of the Women's Pioneer Society. Founded in 1909, the Pioneer Society had 115 members by 1912, many of whom were also active in the Atlanta Ladies Memorial Association. Pioneer women wanted a record of their wartime activities to be passed along to the next generation and so they gave interviews to a reporter for the Atlanta Journal, who then printed them in the newspaper. Several themes emerged from their writings. They paid homage to the lost cause, including Lila Sesson, who insisted that the South was subdued but never conquered. They wanted future generations to know that they cared for soldiers in Atlanta's Confederate hospitals, Lula Cozart re recalled that after the Battle of Chickamauga, she made soup by the gallons. But their most vivid collective memory was General Sherman's bombardment of the city, which went on for five weeks. Lucy Kicklighter recalled that it is impossible to describe to anyone who has never heard the whizzing and the bursting of these shells and the terror that the sound carries. After Sherman's expulsion of, of Atlanta civilians, they scattered to distant directions, but by 1865, many had begun to return, and they often had an emotional reaction upon seeing their home and their city for the first time. Cornelia Venable recalled, we returned home to find our house in ruins and the city a heap of ashes and debris. Very few of Atlanta's pioneer women remarked about the new racial order in the city. 
The one who did so was Lucy Lumpkin Wilson, who expressed astonishment when she er learned that a former slave had been elected to the Georgia legislature after the state constitution enfranchised black men in 1868. A slave she identified as Bob rep uh, represented Macon County, Georgia, and she remarked that when the legislature was in, in session, he stayed in, quote, quartered with the servants in our backyard. Beginning in the 1870s, a subtle shift in Atlanta's commemoration begins to reveal that white citizens were taking modest steps towards reconciliation with the North. Rhetoric of a war in defense of Southern rights continued, but a warmer tone towards the Yankees began to appear in speeches of some Confederate Memorial Day orators. Moreover, by 1875, 10 years after the end of the Civil War, white Atlantans resumed the celebration of our national birthday. The keynote speaker in Atlanta on July 4th, 1875 was Alexander Stevens, the former Vice President of the Confederacy. In his speech, he offered a measured interpretation of the war. If we of the South committed error, either in judgment or policy, in our attempt to withdraw from the Union, it was done in the name of saving the principles of the Constitution. In fighting to prevent Southern independence, the North was equally committed to protecting the Constitution by <coughs> perpetuating the Union. In other words, Alexander Stevens is saying everybody was right. We, we were both for the Constitution, we just had different views of it. And yet in 1861, shortly after being named the Confederacy's Vice President, uh, Alexander Stevens had declared that slavery was the cornerstone of the Confederacy in a widely re reprinted speech in Savannah. Stevens's 1875 speech in Atlanta is one example of the way that white Southerners began a process of forgetting the role that <coughs> slavery played in causing the war. Beginning in the 1870s, John B. Gordon emerged as a leading politician in the state and the principal spokesman for both the lost cause and sectional reconciliation. Gordon was a Confederate military hero who began the war as a captain and ended as a major general. Severely wounded at the Battle of Antietam, he carried a deep scar on his left cheek that was a visceral reminder to people in his audiences of the sacrifices made by himself and others during the war. And he was always photographed after this point, either in profile or semi-profile, or from a distance. So there are some photographs when you can kind of barely make out that very deep facial wound on his left cheek. But if he were standing up here today, you would all know it. So it was a very poignant symbol to people in his audiences of what he had sacrificed and what others sacrif sacrificed. Uh, because he never held independent command during the war, Gordon could bask in the nostalgia of the Confederacy without being blamed for Confederate defeat, unlike his fellow Georgian, James Longstreet. In addition to his post-war political career, Gordon was also an ambitious businessman who was motivated to reconcile with the North in order to boost his financial holdings. To promote both the lost cause and sectional reconciliation simultaneously presented challenges for Gordon, but the handsome and charismatic former general would prove up to the task. He would play both roles extremely well for the rest of his life. But like many white people in the South, Gordon suffered extensive financial losses. Uh, he moved to Brunswick after the war where he went into the timber business. And this was, made him realize just how important it was to reestablish economic ties with the North. However, the timber business did not thrive, and so he moved to Atlanta and built a white columned mansion outside of Atlanta, east of Atlanta, into Cab County called Sutherland. Um, Gordon went into politics, and his election to the U.S. Senate in 1872 represented a milestone in the state's so-called redemption from, from uh, Reconstruction rule. Demonstrating an ability to dissemble when it suited his interests, he testified before a congressional committee 
investing KKK, uh, investigating KKK activities in the South and claimed that the Klan didn't last more than two years. He was also engaged in convict lease very early on and when he realized it was a liability, political liability, he tried to get out of it, but he couldn't get out of it because he had a 20 year lease. But there's no doubt in the mind of, of um, Gordon's biographer about his role in the Klan, he has written that he, quote, occupied a prominent position in the Klan. In the late 1870s, Gordon began building a national career politically uh, as a United States Senator, and in 1878, he led a Southern delegation from Congress to speak before Boston's Commercial Club. In this address, he argued that the war was fought over differing interpretations of the Constitution, but then he did concede that it was, in another sense, a war over slavery. He got in a dig at the North by claiming that the South had no conflict between labor and capital. And this was a dig because there had been a big railroad strike in the North that crippled the economy the previous year. But mostly, Gordon emphasized sectional reconciliation. We differ politically, he said, referencing the North's support for the Republican Party and the South's support for Democrats. But he ended with a strong call for national unity by saying, the causes that divided us are gone. The interests which now <coughs> unite us will unite us forever. Gordon's speech was widely reprinted, both in the Atlanta newspapers and in the national media. And this is like a decade before Henry Grady. In 1889, John B. Gordon was elected the pre president of a new organization of veterans called the Confe United Confederate Veterans, uh, organized in New Orleans. They chose John B. Gordon to be their president, and he would hold this um, position until his death in 1904. The uh, Confederate Veterans Association of Fulton County that I referred to earlier quickly recast itself as the Fulton County Camp of the United Confederate Veterans and they organized a variety of annual activities. For example, they held annual celebrations in Atlanta of Robert E. Lee's birthday. They raised money to contribute to monuments of former Confederates that were being built or erected in the capital, former capital of Richmond. They sent flowers to Chicago when a monument was erected there uh, to commemorate the deaths of Confederate prisoners of war at Camp Douglas and they vetted publications about the war, giving their blessing to those that they thought were sympathetic to their side, including a new, um, a new set of encyclopedia, which came out in 19, oh, uh, 1894. Over time, John B. Gordon became a revered figure among veterans on both sides of the conflict. <coughs> he traveled the country after his retirement in 1890, giving a speech called Last Days of the Confederacy, he gave it dozens, maybe even hundreds of times. Northern soldiers could take pride in defeating the South, while Southern soldiers could take pride in what they regarded as an honorable defeat. The publication of Gordon's memoir in 1903 further cemented his role as both a military hero and a supporter of sectional reconciliation. In Atlanta and throughout the United States, the Spanish-American War of 1898 perhaps did more than anything else to cement feelings of sectional reconciliation. A popular and highly nationalistic war easily but won by the United States, the Spanish-American War included the participation of several high-ranking former Confederates, including Joseph Wheeler, a cavalry commander and a native Georgian. Fort McPherson, south of the city, treated wounded soldiers and also housed Spanish prisoners. In December of 1898, President William McKinley, this is after the war has ended, President war, uh, William McKinley came to Atlanta as the first stop on what is called his Southern Peace Jubilee. In a speech before the Georgia legislature, he declared that sectional lines no longer define the United States and then he astonished members of the audience when he announced that the time has come when in the spirit of fraternity we should share with you in the care of the graves of Confederate soldiers. The U.S. Congress's appropriations for national cemeteries but not for Confederate ones 
had been a sore point with white Southerners since the end of the war. And I should add here that although I'm not into the 20th century yet, I'm not aware that any money actually came this way. But of course, William McKinley was assassinated in 1901. But nonetheless, the symbolism of this was immense. People were astonished that he gave this speech and made this pronouncement. By way of conclusion, as Atlanta entered the new century, the themes of Confederate celebration and sectional reconciliation <coughs> carried forward in tandem. In Atlanta, whites and blacks continued to remember the Civil War in very different ways. White people remembered parts of the Civil War story, including the valor and the sacrifice of soldiers and the support for the war by civilians. Black people celebrated freedom. Racial issues remained unresolved and potentially volatile. And in 1906, the city would erupt in bloody race riots that left at least 26 people dead and the reputation of our new South City in shambles. The Civil War would and still is contested terrain in Atlanta. Thank you. Well, con congratulations, you've really endured. Um, <laughs> now you can take a few weeks. I'll be done in about 15 or 20 minutes. It's going to be short. And then we'll have a great uh, this conversation afterwards up here. I uh, just want to say hello to Joel, my good friend Joel from the archives. I think Joel is, uh, I'm meeting some really, f some of my heroes are here today. Joel has done so much to promote history education among our kids in the state of Georgia. Uh, the fact that he is here, I didn't know you were going to be here, I'm not surprised at all. Uh, he brings the archives to the people of Atlanta. We're very lucky to have him here. Joe, great to, great to see you. Uh, I have to introduce you to one of my bosses, <laughs> uh, Jeannie Syriac, up here in the front. She is the <coughs> Vice Chair of Georgia Humanities. She's also a part of the Grants Committee and is here as a member of the Grants Committee because we, make, we did make a grant uh, to help support this conference. And next to her is a member of our our grants program, uh, Allison Hutton right there. And so if you wanted to sort of talk with her at the end of all of this, please do about the work of, of Georgia Humanities. Uh, I, I, and I gotta tell you, I do not have any, this is it for me, I do not have any slides. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll tell you why. Uh, and that's because uh, I, I've been in the land for 19 years, almost 19 years, and uh, spent a lot of time everywhere else but in Georgia before that. And I am fascinated by Atlanta. I'm fascinated by the state. Uh, I think it's one of the most paradoxical happenings I've ever experienced. Um, full of contradictions, amazements, um, horrible things, beautiful things, and I don't know quite how to put all those together. And in some ways, that's also a description of, I think, our city of Atlanta. So I am trying to work this out, and so the safest thing for me to do is just to read at you, sorry. And, um, and uh, I'm using, actually, as my title, uh, just Aunt Atlanta, as was pointed out. I'll explain a little bit about that, and I hope that in the process of talking to you, I can um, begin explaining some of this to myself, and then maybe in 100 years I might be able to say more. Uh, <clears throat> W.E.B. Du Bois called Atlanta the city south of the north and north of the south. As a New Englander, he spent almost the entirety of his working life in both regions, and so he should know. By that, he meant that this city occupies a special place, its own place, in our own journey. We can say that about every city, really, so what is it about this place, Atlanta? What is the signature of Atlanta? Well, let's stay for a moment with Du Bois' assertion, a city that is both north and south. In that vein, I would hazard we may share more with Boston and Philadelphia than with any other city I can think of in the South. We were all three derivatives of colonial experience, though Atlanta was born during the colony's statehood era. We were all three settled primarily by English and or Scots-Irish. We were all three creatures of transportation, rail or water. <laughs> We all three recognize the legality of human enslavement 
at one time or another, and we all three have deep spiritual roots as a part of our history. As different as we are, we transatlantic Puritans, Quakers, and Oglethorpean Universalists were all visionaries too, in different ways, and people also uh, peopled also by those looking for new opportunity. We all three plied the Atlantic world market with robust diligence, and we all three shared the common experience of the Civil War and the Battle of Atlanta, killing one another. All three are noteworthy metropolis metropolises with packed histories, and all three are economically interdependent today, and especially since Reconstruction. The point of this meandering is to elevate Georgia and Atlanta particularly in geographic space, in the flow of national and even world history affairs. I don't know if this is what Du Bois had in mind a century ago, but I can see something there in his blurring of regional boundaries. Atlanta, the city north of the south and south of the north. Uh, Dr. Vanette's uh, fine book ties in well to some of the themes today, and her study, A Changing Wind, inspires us to think in the broadest and most inclusive terms about our city's history, its flow in a time of war. She recovers the humanity of the enslaved and impoverished and delves equally into the city's wartime commercial elite and their civic philanthropy. And she is mindful of spelling out in her conclusion, which I think she will touch on, and that I had not realized that we were going, to, we, we had agreed to change, but that she touched on uh, just a few minutes ago. Uh, the different stories of the Civil War's meaning, the stories that still have their echoes today. Resilience needs destruction. And by destruction, we mean, I think this has been the lesson of the day, not only the material kind, but also the foundations of the community itself, social structure, human relations, thought patterns, beliefs and wealth. Without some kind of faith or hope, be it civic or personal or spiritual, it is hard to soldier on in a changing wind. We need to become the change if we're to make it through. For me, that's one of the messages of Dr. Vanette's book. Her book also implicitly invites us to ask, how do you take the measure of a place, be it a village, a city, or a nation? If you've never been to the Big Apple or San Francisco or the Windy City, nothing prevents your imagination from taking you there. That's because something lurks in their names. Maybe a historical episode uh, or a song or a film or a piece of personal experience. I do think cities have souls uh, and in their, in their inanimate ways. And I wonder what stirs, what lurks inside our city's name. Something more than a motto or a slogan, that's for sure. Let's listen at a few Atlantans themselves talk about resilience in, or the ways that, that they live their resilience out. Walter White is one of hundreds of stories. Is there any more defamed Supreme Court ruling than the, 19, than the 1896 Plessy versus Ferguson case? which held that so-called separate but equal accommodations in transportation did not violate the Civil War amendments, thereby ratifying Jim Crow. The NAACP's Walter White, a native-born Atlantan who witnessed the city's 1906 race riot, and with his father barely escaped with his life, he was the one who engineered the overturning of the infamous ruling 58 years later in Brown versus Board of Education. Resilient, impactful Atlanta is also the Anti-Defamation League, a 1915 invention of Atlanta's own B'nai B'rith Lodge in direct response to the arrest and prosecution of the religious president, Leo Frank. Resilience is the capable, even joyful mayor oral service of Mayor Jackson, who stated, the only reason I am able to, to, to do anything is because of what my parents and grandparents did, unquote. There were three generations of resilient Baptist ministers in that family who lived and prospered in a Jim Crow world. His paternal great-great-grandfather, an enslaved man named Andrew Jackson, bought his own freedom and founded a church in Atlanta. His maternal grandfather, the great John Wesley Dobbs, was a founder of the Georgia Voters League 
and his mother, Irene Dobbs Jackson, a French professor at Spelman. On the eve of his 1973 election as mayor, when Maynard Jackson said, quote, we have risen from the ashes of a bitter campaign to build a better life for all Atlantans, one guesses he was signaling not just the row with Mayor Massell, but also that other campaign, Lincoln's and Sherman's, that liberated both slaves and owners from the ensnarement of slavery. Resilience is a feature of any vital place or person, and for Atlanta, it may just be written in the stars. I'll turn now to the story of Atalanta of Greek mythology, which may have something to say to us. Parenthetically, I do think a case can be made that the story I'm about to tell you, uh, if you've not heard it before, is the likely source of the city's eponymous name. Atlanta is a Greek, Atlanta, Atalanta is a Greek goddess of ancient mythology known for being fleet of foot. She was also an excellent arm wrestler and a huntress of great talent. And she was beautiful and much desired too, but she liked her freedom. She did agree to marry any man who could beat her in a foot race. One Hippomenes, son of another mythological Greek figure, fell in love with her and challenged her to a race. But he had a trick up his sleeve, literally. As they ran, he would roll a golden ball onto her path, and he had three in all. And each time she stooped to pick it up, wondering at its charms, but also losing some of her lead. By the third apple, Hippomenes finally passed her, and he won the race and her hand, and you can call what he did, you can, and, and you can't call what he did cheating. It was, you might say, a little underhanded on the other hand. The story of Atalanta was well known in Western civilization, as were all the Greek myths. Governor Wilson Lumpkin of Georgia, uh, who was governor from 1831 to 1835, himself knew a great deal about Greek mythology. He carried the books with him wherever he went. Not an unusual occurrence for a college graduate in those days, and so did his father. Governor Lumpkin's visionary idea, as we have heard earlier, was to build a railway line at the Georgia government's expense from Chattanooga down to a point in North Georgia, 138 miles away exactly, and it was dubbed ter Terminus, and marked by a zero-mile post pounded into the ground, about where underground Atlanta is today. Why that particular spot? Because it was ideally situated for linking the ridge and valley region of the northern state with the, with the co lower coastal plain of the Atlantic. Steam locomotion was still a freshly new technology at that time, and it was turning the heads of civic and commercial dreamers, including Governor Lumpkins. Unlike any other city I know of, except maybe Las Vegas, Nevada, this city was founded because it was in the middle of nowhere, so to speak, not even on a navigable river or a wagon road. What it did have going for it was a map coordinate and a sugar plum uh, vision connecting the southern Atlantic world of Savannah, Augusta, and Charleston with the waves of new settlements, settlers spilling into the Ohio River Valley and beyond. What to call this gateway settlement in the North Country, this wager in a futures game? The answer was anything that was not a derivation of the Cherokee or the Creek. Too recent a reminder of their forced expulsion by Andrew Jackson beginning in the 1820s and by Governor Lumpkin himself in order to accommodate his railroad. Side note, the death rate for the Cherokee on the Trail of Tears is estimated to be 25%. As a name for a spot, Terminus, the milepost, was certainly a candidate, hardly an auspicious one. Then came Deanville, Deanville and Thrasherville after local settlers with yet more people by horse and foot, and no rail yet, other names got suggested, including Martha'sville, which after all was the governor's daughter's name, Martha at Atlanta Lumpkin. A flattering compliment to the man who made it possible, and who later became president of the Western and Atlantic Railroad, not missing a, a chance to cash in. 
The name Atalanta was floated to because it was, after all, Martha Lumpkins, the governor's middle name. She was called Atty for short, and it did play cleverly on steam locomotion, which was very fleet of foot. As a bonus, it also played on the railroad's western and Atlantic name. In any event, and always in a hurry, even back then, in 1848, the, official, the city officially and suddenly named itself Atlanta, a word that existed in no dictionary or no lexicon or no mythology. It was said to be the feminine for Atlantic, but then it would have been Atlantica, not Atlanta. Dropping the A in Atalanta, certainly one of the candidates for naming, and perhaps uh, what was an oversight, or maybe just a typo, so to speak. Confirming that hunch, years later, Martha Lumpkin, her, uh, who was buried in the uh, Oakland Cemetery, made a point of adding the middle initial A to her name in the family Bible. The story was picked up and reported on by the Atlanta Constitution in 1893 reminding anyone still paying attention to the uh, 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 still paying attention uh, to the origin of the city's name though misspelled by its founders why belabor this story of Atlanta <coughs> one of those paying attention was W.E.B. Du Bois a professor at Atlanta University in 1906 from his perch in the university Du Bois wrote a powerful essay analyzing the spirit of the city entitled on the wings of Atalanta. He had also just witnessed the race riot of the same year, and was also deep in a long-term research project, and a famous one set in Georgia, on the history of black reconstruction. He believed he was witnessing in his new hometown an eventual upward <coughs> path, even if against the odds. But he also flagged Atlanta's, sto Atalanta's story as a cautionary tale saying if, it's, if, if that's the city's name, not the city's name, it should be. His specific lament was the city's descent into materialism, which he worried was at the expense of the humanities and classical learning, and he used those words, and a correct spiritual pursuit. He saw the 1906 race riot as an economic as much as a racial clash, a competitive fight for more of the pie. He was also deep in his construction of what he called the veil, a socio-psychological racial look on both sides of the color line that hindered mutual self-recognition and recognition of other. What kind of society does Atlanta wish for, he was asking. The pursuit of mammon, as he would have bluntly put it, or the pursuit of learning and real advancement. I want to conclude on this note of what resilience looks like. I can't speak for how this compares with the stories that of other cities, because every city's story is uniquely its own. And we are still familiar with the congratulatory dinner that Mayor Ivan Allen arranged for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in January of 1865 in recognition of his Nobel Peace Prize. We also know that white business leaders at first didn't want to buy tickets to the event and that the New York Times was paying close attention to see which way the city too busy to hate was going to jump, which way the wind was blowing in the very capital of ambitious boosterism. Was it going to leap ahead, Atlanta style, or was it going to fall back on the familiar color line, which was by now a Cold War embarrassment? The city did not blow it. About 500 distinguished black and white celebrants, men and women, the city's interracial elite, spent the evening in formal wear inside the Dinkler Hotel celebrating the arrival of a different kind of Atlanta. It was rocky. It almost didn't happen, but still, in flagrant violation of all the city's segregation ordinances, it needs also to be counted as one of the remarkable and even courageous acts of civil disobedience in American history. I shudder to think of what we might be today if corporate and civic white Atlanta and its churches had turned their backs. But isn't this also the Atlanta way? Swift of foot, sure but wizened to, knowledgeable that as alluring as the golden apple is and always will be, there's another prize for a race well run 
called Unity. We're coming up to a 200th anniversary of Atlanta's founding, not too far in the future, depending on what is counted as the founding. Not bad for a city mostly burned to the ground in wartime and its occupants forcibly evicted, perhaps uh, a distinction in US history, I think it is, I believe. Maybe it is true that the city that, that the city seems always to rise again from the ashes like a phoenix. That's a reason why it's our official motto, I suppose, this eternal opportunity of one more chance, a second go-round. Like all the hopeful and no doubt fretful attendees at the King Dinner in 1965, we can appreciate the grace of a new beginning. If the image of beauty emerging from fire and ashes says anything, it suggests that from pain and suffering, a shining new opportunity can, can arise to get things right. Resilience suggests these new beginnings are not squandered or taken lightly, but nourished also with wisdom gained from past pain and built on ever more solid foundations of humility, self-understanding, and mutual respect. Look around the city today. I think you will see signs of this resilience and growth everywhere. The city has shown itself willing to grapple with its past. Thank you. Thank you. What we will try to do now is have something of a free form open discussion. Uh, we're going to have not just this afternoon's panelists, but any of this morning's panelists who would like to come up, pull up some chairs, and we'll essentially turn over the initiative as to what we discuss uh, to those of you who remain. There are about 40 of you left. That, uh, that's pretty good for an all-day thing. And uh, for those of you who uh, spent the entire day with us, uh, we welcome uh, both your questions and your comments. Uh, you've had a chance to uh, see quite a wide spectrum of, frankly, what I think were very good presentations that I think lived up to the promise of uh, new perspectives. And let me encourage you to think of, again, either comments. Don't get into a great deep long thing, but perhaps uh, suggestions on what we might do next or something that we missed uh, that you would like to, to see pursued or uh, questions that relate directly to what some of our speakers have uh, addressed today. Are we pretty much all here? There is Marty is looking for Quincy. He's back at the ah, There he is. He's busy eating. <laughs> Okay, we'll assume Quincy will work his way <coughs> up here. Uh, we do have we have plenty of chairs, and uh, we'll try to stay on schedule. Doug, you want to come on up? <laughs> and let me ask, who would like to get us started? It's interesting, isn't it? Again, this is something we're free for all. Yes, sir. Um, let me ask each of you. Uh, Chris, do we have an extra microphone? Chris is going to come by so that we can all hear. Do we not all hear? And let me ask each of you who has either a comment or a question to, first of all, identify yourself. And then we'll have Jessica, not Chris, <laughs> come by and give you the mic. Uh, my name is Dick Plunkett, and something I wondered about is uh, at the end of the war, the money was worthless, and many of the old stores of value uh, were also worthless, or they had been carted off, other than land, which is notoriously not fungible. Uh, other than what were the sources of, of uh, actual money coming in other than the army pay uh, and how did, how did uh, an economy working on a shortage of actual cash make do? 
Okay, there there are multiple parts to the answer to that. Does anyone want to get started? Okay. Wendy? Okay, I can talk about that a little bit. Um, is this working? Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, you're correct that there was no money and there weren't very many greenbacks either. Greenbacks were uh, it was a type of federal currency. Um, the city council began issuing, I think they called them bonds, of their own kind of personal paper money that they, will ta they would take in, um, as taxes. And it, even as tiny little amounts, like 25 cents. And then they immediately rebuilt the city market, which was a major uh, source of income from the city. Farmers bringing their produce into the city. That had been a big part of the uh, economy of Atlanta before the war and during the war. And so they rebuilt it, a temporary market and then a bigger market. And then uh, this helped bring food into the city and they started issuing this paper money, this sort of scrip, and that got Atlanta through the immediate period that you're talking about. Well, of course, you also had barter. You know, you want you want medical treatment? Give me a chicken. Right. You know, you you want a haircut? Give me an apple. That kind of stuff to work. And you, there was one story um, when the Confederate when Jefferson Davis was trying to get away, uh, the Confederate Treasury was not with him, but was sort of on a parallel course uh, on the same track he was. And when they paid off the Confederate cavalry escorts, uh, right about uh, in Lincoln County, Georgia, right there by the Savannah River, they gave him what's called specie, which is another name for currency, because it was coins. And coins tended to retain value because they were metal. And people would accept something that was gold or silver, even if it wasn't from the issuing agency to which you belonged. And so they all, they all wound up getting $26.25 in coins, uh, which probably got most of them home, I would think. Was, that was not nothing at that time. It was more money than it's worth now, so to speak, from a inflation standpoint. Those coins, or any form of, of literally hard currency, tended to appreciate in value during these times and became more valuable. There's also a peculiar, uh, and, and there are photographs of these things, and remember money is essentially a matter of trust. It's, it's something that is usually intrinsically worthless in its own right, whether it's paper or coins, gold, what have you, is, is not a metal of, of great value, at least until the, the world of electronics. And so it's essentially what people agree to accept on a temporary basis or on a longer term basis. Uh, but one thing that uh, occurred for a, a little bit of time is that the U.S. Treasury stamped some of the old Confederate money in a way that said, this is good now, at least for the time being. <coughs> there are actually photographs of these things. In fact, uh, one particular photograph in one of the well-known uh, uh, histories of, of Atlanta. And so a whole lot of different things were used and uh, people were really quite desperate and were willing to put a lot of trust, uh, particularly in those, those uh, if you like, bonds that, uh, that Wendy mentioned. And people basically worked for a fairly short period of time with that kind. There's, a, there's an expression of confidence on the part of people who are prepared to accept that kind of thing for the, the short term uh, and have confidence that they won't regret it. Okay. It, it's, it was a messy thing, but it somehow more or less worked out. And of course, there's a certain amount of cheating. Uh, the, the, you know, the, the convict labor thing um, was a way of, of essentially getting slave labor back. Um, if you read the 13th Amendment, it makes an exception uh, for people who are basically imprisoned and um, in quite almost literally they were re-enslaved because they were in prison. Uh, yes sir, is, Mr. Israel. Uh, my name is Bruce Israel. Wait, wait, wait for Jessica, although you're pretty long. <laughs> <laughs> and she's pretty far away. <laughs> My question is about the uh, situation that when I came to Atlanta in the 60s uh, to attend graduate school at Georgia Tech. This is the 1960s, right? Yes, <laughs> 1960s. <laughs> yeah. uh, very close. 
Uh, anyways, uh, at that time, the word Republican was almost a dirty word in uh, not only Atlanta, but so-called Solid South. And um, the entire uh, congressional delegation from Georgia and uh, almost all the other states were uh, Soviet Democrats. That has changed dramatically, and my question is, what do you attribute uh, that uh, drastic change in a relatively short amount of time? The Civil Rights Act of 1964. Yes. Yes. But that took still uh, a number of years, maybe a couple of decades before. Yeah, but you remember the yeah. Lyndon Johnson and Richard Russell had a discussion, and essentially, Russell said if you pass the Civil Rights Act and the Accommodations Act that we'll lose the Solid South within a generation. And it turns out that was what happened. Now whether Russell was predicting what would actually happen accurately, the result did it obtain. That uh, essentially that was what broke up the Solid South. Uh, Bill here, where oh. Jessica? Jessica's coming up right behind you. Again, please identify yourself and make your comment or ask your question. Uh, my name is Bill Gerger, and I'm going to recite a couple of more recent events and ask if these are aberrations or whether they are signs of an underlying problem that still exists in Atlanta. For example, the fight over the Confederate battle symbol and flag the uh, the Ku Klux Klan resurrection on Stone Mountain, even though it's go back a few years. And most recently, the situation in Gwinnett County with this, con this counselor under whatever his name is. Um, is this something that, again, is there this underlying current that we will continue to see, or are these just aberrational type situations? I'd say it's an underlying current that you're going to continue to see in some form or another for a long time. The Confederate flag symbol went through a period where it wasn't all that immediately identified as racist. But you remember in the 1950s with the, uh, the different civil rights legislation that was beginning even then and the overturning of Blessing, Blessing versus Ferguson and the oncoming of Brown versus Board of Education. It was in 1956 that the state of Georgia changed its flag to incorporate the battle flag symbol. And as Denmark Hoover, I think, who was the state legislature leader? I think that was his name. Right. He, he said quite avowedly that the governor at the time told him as the floor leader that that was specifically as a protest against integration of the public schools. And so people said, oh no, it was just, you know, honoring our Confederate ancestry. No, it was a direct slap in the face to Brown versus Board of Education. And it, fortunately, he had the courage to admit it before he died. Otherwise, people would still be arguing about it. Well, they're, they're probably still arguing about it, but he said that's in fact what it was. And so the, the flag at that point became much more of an invalid segregationist symbol than it had been before. Uh, and I think it's... I mean, when I went to Georgia Tech in the 60s, they still played Dixie. Uh, it phased out during the time I was there. But it wasn't considered such uh, a racist symbol as it is today. It's ironic because Dixie first premiered in New York, and it was written by guys from Ohio. And it was written as a song to just get people out of the theater between shows because they wanted to play some up-tempo song. Uh, and it's honestly it's one of the great toe tapping songs of all time it's a great marching song because it really has a driving rhythm to it but now it's you can't play Dixie and not be considered a racist which is unfortunate it's not a bad piece of music uh, as far as Mr. Tempo Lincoln goes. thought so yeah I mean explicitly. Lincoln said now it belongs to us and he had him play it uh, during the celebration of Lee's surrender uh, he came out on the balcony uh, as far as Tommy Hunter and his insanity of calling John Lewis a racist pig, they, I mean, you just have people like that that do stupid things. Uh, I don't know how much of a racist symbol that is as much as just somebody that <coughs> lost control of his senses uh, 
in that event. What was the third thing you mentioned? The flag, Tommy Hunter, and it was the event about the Stone Mountain. Oh, which the Stone Mountain. You know, the, which the, went away that's the that's the clan of the 1915-1920, which was in many ways the much more pernicious uh, incarnation of the clan. The clan died out by the 1870s to a large extent, uh, and didn't recur again until. And that the, the clan of the 1915 to 1920 that became very strong in places like Indiana uh, had a much more religious and anti everything theme to it than just anti black. It was anti Jewish, it was anti immigrant, it was anti Catholic. Uh, that's a second clan, and it happened to be reinstituted or reconstituted to a large extent with Stone Mountain as a symbol. Um, much so, of its membership was in the Midwest. I yeah, think. that's why I said Indiana was the, the like the I think by percentage the highest number of Klan members were in Indiana for per population. I'm sorry, I'm trying Somebody to. Think. Yeah. Well, I just have personal comments. I practiced pediatrics for 35 years. My practice started with uh, two other Anglo-Saxons. I ended up, and all three Christians. I ended up with. Two Jewish partners, two black partners. One of the Jewish partners was gay. Uh, I had thousands of patients. I saw 7,000 patient visits a year. The IRS kept up with that. Uh, <laughs> I can tell you, 25% of them are probably black. Uh, I wrote my prescriptions in Spanish to my Hispanic patients because they were illiterate in English, and half of them were illiterate in Spanish. I referred patients to black doctors. Black doctors referred patients to me. I put said white patients to black doctors. I think it's overrated. What I think, it's just this, it's a fly in the ointment. You know, I mean, it's just, it's one bad cherry in a bushel. Uh, I see racial harmony wherever I go. Uh, my wife was honored at a black church. Uh, with a, with a black lady, they called them salt and pepper uh, as they raised money for the homeless women. Um, I just think it's, a, it's the papers making it up. Uh, I, was, I, was at a, I was on a board, Zell Miller put me on a board, allocating money to medical schools. We had a budget of $43 million. I get paid nothing. Um, a black physician from Morehouse made a statement that black patients receive lousy care in white doctors' offices compatible to white patients. It ticked me off. In a public meeting with 100 people, I paid him $5,000, $5,000, that he could come to my office with a fake black mother, I mean a black mother with a fake patient with her child and see if she was treated differently in my office. And I said, I'll tell you what, I'll raise it to $10,000. He said, well, how, how can you be so sure? I said, half my staff is black. i got two black partners. Who is going to discriminate? I just think, I don't want to say it like this, but I think Shakespeare said it best. A lot of it is much ado about nothing. There's a few bad apples here and there, but i got Jewish friends, black friends, Hispanic. I, I, I introduced Palestinians in my office from, from Palestine to Israelis. Jews from Israel, and they became friends. Uh, I, you know, maybe I'm naive, but uh, I have not seen what some people are talking about in the years that I've lived in this community. Anyone uh, else want to comment on that? Just very quickly. I think, uh, I think it's I think it's important to move beyond the individual to the larger collective. And so I take everything you said, right, and say that's fantastic, right? Uh, but it's important for us to think about a larger society, right? And, you know, yes, uh, the, it, you're talking about, I, I actually see it every day. Um, and so uh, I think certainly there are, there are seeds of progress and uh, spaces of, you know, uh, so to put it differently, there's a way in which I think we have to go beyond questions of race relations, right? Which is the friends we have and the company that we keep, and think more about structural, systemic issues. And so, 
mass incarceration exists not because of because of some racist person, right? It because it, it, it exists because of racist institutions, right? And so uh, it's important for us, and, and it's those institutions, it's those structures that uh, uh, in many ways, um, uh, many folk of color are, are sort of butting heads against, right? Again, it's not individual people, right? It's institutions, and certainly there are ages of institutions that uh, uh, folks are enacting with. But it's, it's, it's important to move beyond notions of race relations, right? Um, I.e., you know, integration as a way of peopling, right? So you put black kids in a class with white kids and great, there's progress. No, not if the power dynamics are, are, are not changed, right? Not if the, the AP classes are still peopled by white students and the black kids don't get in the AP classes, right? So I think it's important for us as we as we think about your um, your question and think about progress and think about the city itself, uh, is to sort of be sure that we are in tune to structural issues. Okay, another question. A uh, lady way in the back, close to Jessica. Lady in red. <coughs> your name, please, and your. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Lorraine Caribbean. I have two comments and one question. Uh, for Wendy, uh, was the Cornelia Venable you were referring to the Venable family from Stone Mountain? Uh, not, not that I know of. Okay. And I have a comment. I think Mr. Uh, is it Douglas? I don't know. Fleming. Fleming. Right. Um, you uh, referring to a book from uh, about riches? Um, was that by Jeff Clements? Yes. Well, I texted Jeff because I know him personally. While you were. <laughs> that uh -oh. but no, that's that's what my students do now. You know? <laughs> when, I, when I give a, you know, I say this is a this is a fact. You know, they're all on their phones checking it out. So, uh, this is a first. Okay. So well, right anyway, yeah. Jeff says that you go. Um, the reason for the riches moving here to Atlanta was because of the infrastructure of the train. Uh, that there were two uh, trains that split uh, to Albany, and then there was one um, that went to Chattanooga. So this was a good source of moving their, uh, their business out to those areas from the Atlanta hub. Um, and then I had one comment to your question about um, seeing Atlanta rise as a one-faced one community in some ways. In other words, we stand solidly um, in the question of race and Dixie. You know, if you ever go to Stone Mountain and go to the fireworks on the on the stone, you know what we all do sometimes. Yeah, the laser show. Every nationality is there. Every color, every age group, um, from all walks of life. And at the end, everybody sings Dixie together. It, it really is interesting. Uh, well, I don't know who's singing it, but to be honest, point, but it's the point that everybody sings at that time, at least when I've been there. And they are all of, you know, they're all Atlanta, you know, they're all uh, for that one thing. But the thing I see in my business as we've at least come out of this recession is that we have more of a divide now between the socioeconomic situation than we do color or nationalities. It's the people who have better incomes and the better jobs are being very, very separated from those of the least of those. So that would be my comment on one city moving together. Okay. Thank you. Other no comments? Uh, the lady up front here, please. Yes, she's coming. I just wanted to come in. Uh, name, please. Oh, I'm Jackie Henry. I'm a genealogist and a retired nurse. Um, I wanted to come in just uh, anecdotal that when I went to Stone Mountain to the Leisure Show, which was about probably 10 years ago, unfortunately I was there the night that the skinheads were there, and I was very, I was very uncomfortable. And I'm sure that just happened to be happened to be that night. So. I know things, um, and, and I've been in Atlanta since 1959, so I've seen a lot of, and I consider myself a historian, 
And I'm a member of Big Bethel AME Church, the church that start, started by slaves in 1847, the first black church in Atlanta. And I've done a lot of research. And the question, the answer to your big long question, Dr. Seuss question, <laughs> it's going to take another 100 years. <coughs> Anyone else? Yes, here. Uh, Allison. I'm Allison Hutton, and my question is for Doug. I was very fascinated to see about Atlanta United in this spike that they're driving into the ground because. I had happened to be researching the team for another project, and if you read the, I don't know if you've happened to look at the, um, the about section of their website, they talk about the evolution of the club, and they're talking about Terminus, they're talking about, they're like writing themselves into the history of Atlanta. Um, I'd love to hear more about that from you. <laughs> well, uh, all I can say is that the rhetoric of the website I went to the website because I love soccer and I was very happy that we had a major league team coming and uh, so I went to the website and look that's where I recently discovered this um, everlasting tradition that's been, I think, three weeks now. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but I, I, I do think that this gets that this gets this is the merger of the uh, the two seals that I showed, uh, the, the 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 1854 railroad seal, which is uh, you know, that's one Atlanta that still exists, logistics movement merchandise. Art of the deal, and but the and then this larger ideal, and I, I I don't I'm still stunned by the way that they wrote them or are writing themselves into history and the way that and what's very interesting and I hope you'll do more with it, Allison. I I I don't think I will. I think I'll just watch the. The football, but I. But it is fascinating that, for example, they're bringing out this spike to hit, and the celebrity they're bringing out is an African American hip hop artist, you know, to represent, and that the, uh, you know, that their lead, the guy I showed, you know, uh, Martinez, nailing the spike in and create, you know being part of the new Atlanta is from Argentina. Um, now, I, I, I'm upset at Argentina because they had him play for the national team and he pulled his hamstring and now he's out. And so uh, now I have a kind of nationalistic antagonism toward the Argentina team. No, I'm kidding about this. <laughs> I'm kidding about this. But I, 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 was, I, I did find this fascinating. And I think you're right to have been fascinated by it. And I don't know what to to make of it, but I'm certainly going to keep an eye out on it. I'm not going to just ignore it and watch the football because it's too, it's too important. And I think that there is a sense in which Arthur Blank and, and, and other, and the leaders of Coca-Cola and Delta and Google UPS, you know, I think that they are trying to create an Atlanta that looks and sounds like that. Governor Deal vetoed the so-called Religious Tolerance Act, what we might call the Religious Intolerance Act or the, the Gender Intolerance Act, <clears throat> under great pressure to sign it he had to be under great pressure not to sign it. Who? Uh, who, who was pressuring him not to sign it? Uh, and the answer has to be Delta Coke. Uh, uh, you know, the, yes, yes. Uh, so. Not to mention all the people in this room. 
<laughs> well, we were, but we, you know, that's not going to move. That's right. not going to move the governor. So, so we'll have to see. I, I mean, I think it's. Um, I don't know whether to see it as kind of superficial marketing or a deeper, thoughtful hope for the future. It may be superficial, but somebody put a lot of thought into that to creating this this rhetoric that surrounds the team. Agreed. Well, Arthur Blank owns the team, and he's no marketing fool, that's for sure. We have this lady here. Um, oh, wait, wait. Oh. Your name? And wait for the mic. <laughs> it helps us. We're recording, and oh, okay. this is helping. My name is Barbara Lande. Um, yeah, I think to me, to some extent, it's superficial because you have these big companies, okay? They want a new stadium so the rich people can go to the football games. We already have a stadium that's better than a lot of other places, but we have to have a new stadium. Where do they put it? They don't put it on the north side in the middle of Buckhead. They put it in a poor, poor African-American communities who are impacted, but nobody cares about their impact. Um, the Beltline, <coughs> which I thought was a great thing from the beginning, but it's starting to have housing effects. And they're supposed to, the Beltline, affordable housing. And a lot of those communities are poor, and a lot of them are black. This is the institutional, where the institutional racism comes in, and where this divide between poor and well off, but a lot of it is also colored by race. Uh, Georgia State's, Turner Field, okay, Georgia State's development over there. Again, the, the communities worked on some plans to get some benefit out of it, and nobody, Georgia State and the development company, don't want to talk to them, don't want to hear about it, no matter how many protests and demonstrations. The city of Atlanta, the city council seems to be, I don't know why, after that poor homeless shelter on Peachtree Street that houses a few hundred people, we don't have to, we don't have to, we're not doing anything to put them anywhere. Do you love walking through the street and seeing people on the street, sleeping on the street? I mean, in our wonderful, sophisticated city? So, you know, um, Certainly this conflict, I still think said the institutional racism, the, the inequalities that are happening in terms of income all over the country between wealth and poor are evident in Atlanta. On top of which, even if the city of Atlanta really wanted to do the best job it could, it would be hampered by a state legislature, as it is many places where you have a more rural, unsophisticated, maybe more racist element affecting what a city that's generally a little more sophisticated wants to do. Okay, we, does someone have a very pressing comment? Uh, somebody has pointed, oh, to Dimitri, please. Well, I think he wanted to comment. I think Mark wanted to comment. I'd like to mention about homelessness. I lived in a psychiatric hospital for three years. I was not a patient, I was a medical <laughs> student working my way through school. In 1961, the Democratic Congress passed this Community Act where they're going to break up these large mental hospitals and send these people to halfway houses to be near their families. Every psychiatrist that I knew, must have been about 30 of them, all said, that's insane. That's insane. The families didn't want them. Nobody, once Ken Kennedy got assassinated, nobody funded it. Right, nobody funded it. Right. I have worked with the homeless in this city since 1970, my wife and I. I can tell you, 50% of the women are mentally ill. Oh, I believe that. And 25% of the men are mentally ill. Mm -hmm. When you start talking to them, for three minutes they're great, and then all of a sudden they see Jesus. I'm telling you, it, it's scary. Right. We have saved, states have saved money by closing down mental hospitals. Rockland County in New York, I mean, uh, Kings Park in New York, uh, Milledgeville is probably a fourth of its size. 
they're, they're mentally ill. I don't know where you house them. Families don't want them. Yeah. It's a tough yeah, question. Yeah, but we're not, we're, let, let, we're not coming up with the Yeah, we're just about at the end of time. Let's have Dimitri make the last comment or ask the last question. Well, I guess what I'm looking at, uh, I've listened to it quite a bit of this. What I'm finding is the interpretation of history between the African Americans and the Caucasians is it remains completely different. Uh, you can tell where the basically where their resources came from, because it colors their interpretation of history, and they are both potentially dealing with fact. Uh, because I think <coughs> the Crawford and the Mills interpretation of history, similar events or identical events, slightly different interpretations. Uh, on the other hand, I, as I was discussing with uh, saw yesterday, uh, my great-grandmother on my dad's side was half black and half Indian. My great-grandfather on my mother's side was half black and half Indian. That's American Indian. Black. American Indian. And I spent a part of my life in the Tuscarora Indian Reservation on the edge of Niagara Falls. And so every summer we would go there and we'd make into Arizona. There's very little that's done on African American Indian slavery and non slaves marrying uh, African Americans. So I'd like to see some more in that. Um, the other thing is that uh, Maynard, and my uncle, my uncle was the first one to be selected to run for governor of Atlanta, or uh, mayor of Atlanta. Eli Moore, and he was uh, Director of Economic Opportunity in Atlanta. But he was under investigation by another friend of mine from Portland, Oregon. He was an investigative reporter. They investigated him for potential fraud. But after spending $300,000 on the investigation, we found out that $27,000 of its $300 million um, $300 annual budget was done due to the incorrect addition of pennies for a number of years. So he recommended Maynard. <coughs> on, the other, on the other end, Dr. Martin Luther King, that was responsible for the conversion of Penn Center where they held the secret talks for the Civil Rights Movement in Beaufort, South Carolina. And so. You know, there's a lot of history that really needs to be researched. There also has to be some agreement <coughs> between the resources done by African Americans and also done by Caucasians. Because the difference of interpretation is too large. Okay. Side, there's one. She's had her hand up to okay. for a while. Okay. Oh, yet one more. But nobody's getting up, so but we do have to <laughs> close this off. This yes. question is, you, you, who are you? I'm Elizabeth Buttermer, and this question is primarily um, addressed to Professor Mills. Um, could you give us a, more examples of uh, <coughs> typical entrepreneurship opportunities uh, for African Americans at the time of Reconstruction? Pass the mic down to uh, the um, so uh, during, so right, so, um, Tara Hunter's work, uh, so I, I'm going to do something a bit differently than, than you're asking me, um, largely because there's a way in which what I hoped, to, what I was trying to do in my talk, or didn't do, do a good job, was to sort of recast the very notion of entrepreneurship. Um, and so what we see during Reconstruction is African Americans essentially trying to eke out a bit of economic opportunity for themselves, right? And so for, for, um, for many men, for example, that, that would have been um, uh, them toiling at traits that maybe they had done uh, uh, bef um, before the war or during the war, right? So sort of artisans, right? The blacksmiths, the carpenters, right? They would have sort of tried to have uh, independent businesses uh, doing that kind of work. Um, for women, as you might imagine, those opportunities were not as plentiful. Uh, and so for uh, black women who 
for the most part, were confined to domestic um, um, labor positions. Um, uh, Sarah Hunter, historian, um, she's her book is um, To Joy My Freedom, uh, and she talks about Atlanta uh, after the war and Reconstruction and thereafter, and the ways in which black women essentially um, uh, 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 preferred to do household work, the sort of preferred to do the work uh, or wash clothes, right, for their white employers at their own homes instead of doing it at uh, white women's homes because it gave them more space, it gave them more autonomy to do that work. They could look after their kids, right, in ways that they couldn't if they were doing the work inside of white homes. And so I think there's a way in which um, independence is probably economic independence in, in that pursuit. Uh, is, a, is a, I would say, a more fruitful way to think about it. Um, but uh, there were, again, cer certainly uh, uh, many women who were beauticians. Remember, they didn't have shops, but they did, they did people's hair. Um, there were gro black, black grocers. Um, and uh, Du Bois' Atlanta studies, uh, well, what's Atlanta studies is, and he has a, uh, one of those studies was uh, of black businesses. And he talks about a plethora of those kinds of businesses, small, and then we talk about small businesses uh, that African Americans would uh, uh, indeed open. We see many more businesses after Reconstruction, certainly during the 1880s, 1890s, uh, during the rise of Jim Crow. Um, and so there are many more businesses then that we do see right after the war and certainly during Reconstruction. Okay, uh, let me just make one comment. This is the third symposium of both this size and uh, format and what have you that we have done in about as many years. Uh, it will not be the last. We're not sure of the next topic, but Doug and I are actively uh, thinking about possibilities. Uh, I'd like uh, a, a round of, to just bring up a, a round of thank yous. First of all, for all of our speakers, I think all of them did a really remarkable job and helped us all, I think, with the title, New Perspectives on a Subject uh, that has been worked on for the last 150 years, and I think we did add some new perspectives. Uh, I'd also like to thank all of you for being here, not just the 30 or some uh, who are still left. Uh, I think at one point we were probably about in the 80 range or what. Oh, it, was, it was more like 120. 120. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Top notch. Uh, one of these days I'll learn to count once again. <laughs> uh, uh, but in any case, um, we appreciate uh, your being here uh, and we appreciate the interest. I mean, it, it, it was great looking around the room and not seeing too many people doze off or <laughs> their noses stuck in, in their iPads or what have you doing God knows what, uh, which happens frankly all too frequently with students in our classes. And uh, I'd like to also once again thank uh, Mary Lou and uh, Chris for uh, helping out uh, at, you know, in an absolutely essential way with making this possible in, in uh, at the very least a logistical sense, but actually much more than that. And uh, also, once again, thank our three sponsors, the Callahan Fund, the Rich Foundation, and uh, the Georgia uh, uh, Humanities Council. And with that, let me bring this to a close, and let's give all of ourselves a